Howdy, y'all. Uh, Professor Parks back again. Welcome again back to the channel. If you were here earlier for my stellar, see what I did there, talk on the moon. Um, so, yeah, tonight or this particular stream is just going to be me sort of rambling. But I have to say that I have to admit a certain amount of frustration because I was all set to talk about a particular topic, talk about a particular paper, and then I could not replicate my results, essentially. Uh, so I had, I had looked into the particular uh, this topic of uh, Polaris's distance uh, at home. I had fairly easily found what everything that I wanted to find. Uh, and then when I came here, I was like, oh, I could easily do, easily do that again. Nope, not so much. Um, I, I just now have gotten to where, I, where I've uh, found everything. Hey, real sickness. Howdy. Uh, so, yeah, I apologize. I'm a bit miffed um, because that was very, very irritating because um, now I'm just all kinds of discombobulated. All right. Well, let's see if I can I can pull it around, pull it out. <laughs> Not be irritating for you, folks. So. And if it's if I'm too dark, please let me know. I I don't like overheads, and so I need to figure out my my lighting situation probably sooner rather than later. Um, let's see. Let's do. Let's make sure I close that so that I don't accidentally show that to everyone in the universe. Um, so, all right. So where should I start? Um, I was just, I invited so there was a there's a flat earther by the name of uh, Dan the Waterman. I actually had a conversation with Dan uh, some number of weeks months ago, um, if I remember, which I never do. But if I remember, I'll put the link uh, in the description of this with Dan in yeah, the description. Um, so you can go back and check out my uh, my conversation with him. And uh, good guy. He is highly suspicious of, of NASA. Uh, he's highly suspicious of, I believe, the government in general. Um, but we had a great conversation. And, and basically, I, I, I kind of got a better perspective on who he was, where he was coming from, that sort of thing. Um, and we kind of touched base back and forth occasionally. Well, he sends me a DM, out of, basically out of nowhere. Uh, he sends me a DM and basically uh, gives me an invite to a Discord channel um, by the name of, uh, wait for it, uh, Earth Awakenings, which from my understanding is, oh, and Dan's on there right now, um, which is a, um, which is a Discord for uh, flat earthers, concave earthers, hollow earthers, uh, any kind of earther you will possibly can imagine. Uh, they're there. They're discussing things. Um, and he, he sent me an invite to this place. So I went. I, I clicked it on. And, and I went. And it is run by, uh, among others, uh, a gentleman by the name of Geo. And for those of you who uh, may know this gentleman, Austin Wits it Gets It, a YouTuber who is very fond of the Electric Universe and all that kind of good stuff. I actually did a, a, a Sunday coffee and science, although I think it was on Monday. I, I did a coffee and science about his, uh, about his, uh, or someone told me he had uh, he had issues with astronomical redshifts. So I addressed those claims. I don't want to say that they came directly from Witsit, but I was told that they did, and I, I addressed those. So, um, one of these days I'll actually get to talk to what's it like on a stream or what have you, but you know, that I'm sidetracking myself. So I got invited to this and I, uh, to the server by Dan and I, and I was asked to, to join because Geo had apparently had some questions that I could address that he thought he, I could address. Uh, and I was like, okay, sure. So I got on there eventually and I get into a conversation with them. And I think I'm about to let them know that I'm having a conversation about them and see what happens. But uh, I had a conversation with them. It was, 
mostly cordial. There were a few people who were um, were testing my patients, but uh, it was it was good. It was good. And in one of those, yet again, Witsit says it was point. It was uh, it was ta uh, told to me that somehow distances came up, and uh, I think it was Geo. He asked the question something of the effect of, "What do you think about the 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 change in the distance to Polaris?" Um, and I was like, "I, well, I don't know what you mean." And he said that Witsit again. This is a third hand uh, or second hand. So that Witsit had claimed that the change of uh, that dis the distance to Polaris, our North Star, had changed fairly recently and but fairly significantly. Uh, the implication is that uh, essentially since astronomy can't even get that right, that we shouldn't place any faith in uh, astronomical distance measurements. And in so doing, that will remove one of the stumbling blocks to uh, accepting flat Earth, because for me, uh, as I describe, as I explained to them, if if the Earth is flat, that means that maybe I should take this the other way. The universe is vast. Astronomy tells me that the universe is vast. The universe runs on a certain law, on a certain laws of physics, on certain laws of nature. Those laws of nature then tell me that the Earth is has to be a globe. Um, I mean, I know for other reasons why the Earth is a sphere, but just the basic physics of it tells me that the Earth needs to be a sphere. And so um, this claim that these astronomical distances cannot be trusted and shouldn't be and don't mean anything, I think has been a way of sort of combating that. It's like, oh, well, if the stars are local, then it's much more likely that the Earth is flat than a sphere. I'm not a flat earther. I'm not going to really go it too far into uh, why this is a, an argument that they choose to make, why this is a claim that they, uh, they are making. What I want to address is Polaris and the change in distance. Because honestly, I had never heard of it. I had never heard of this. I had never heard that the distance of Polaris was ever in question. Uh, Polaris, for those of you who don't know, is a very prominent star. It is considered the North Star because it essentially is at the North Celestial Pole. Not quite, but um, but close enough for, for government work. Uh, it is not the brightest star. There has I have met people with that misconception. Uh, Polaris is actually kind of midland bright. It's I think has a I think it has an apparent magnitude two-ish, two something or, or other. Um, so there are plenty of stars that are brighter. There are definitely plenty of stars that are dimmer. Uh, it's notable because it's right there. It's also kind of notable, but um, because that uh, I, some poet somewhere I can't remember who I, I I was I meant to actually look it up before the stream. You know, as steady as the North Star, which in actual fact is not very steady at all, because uh, Polaris is what we call a pulsating variable or a Cepheid variable. So I didn't know about this distance thing. I didn't know that there was a there was a uh, um, conflict. So I was like, oh, all right. Well, I can't speak to that right now, gentlemen, but uh, folks. But I can. Let me look into it, and you know, I'll, I'll address it. And so I did. And where really the point that I'm getting at, and where I'm going with this, is that. Um, uh, one of the reasons I've been asked, why do I engage with people from the flat earth community or people from the, I guess now the hollow earth concave earth community is that uh, it's a number of different reasons. Um, the main one is I want to know why, uh, why they believe the things that they do, because as someone else pointed out um, during that conversation, because I asked them, you know, I asked Gio, why do you have this why do you have this belief? What is what it was it in your experience that led you to the confidence that the Earth is flat? Whereas my experience leads me to the confidence that the Earth is a sphere. Why? And then someone piped in and was like, "Do you, uh, you know, do you think we choose this? We choose this life because?" And he goes off on how they're ostracized, they're called idiots, uh, they're ridiculed. Uh, it really is kind of a. a Admitting to the world that you believe the Earth is flat is really inviting a whole lot of ridicule 
uh, upon yourself and going to cause great rifts in your family, so forth, in your relationship. So, yeah. And, and I kind of reversed it on him. I was like, yeah, that's exactly the question is why, given all of this, given all of the negativity, all of the, the uh, backlash that you're going to experience, why, what is it in your life? What is it in your experience that leads you to such a confidence that the earth is flat and stationary as opposed to what accepted science tells us? Another reason why I do it is because I occasionally learn stuff, which is cool. Learning stuff is always cool. So, um, you know, when they told me about this, uh, this difference thing, I did what anyone with a, with a high IQ does. And... I, uh, ah, maybe I should do, uh, yeah, I know what I want to do. I want to put this over here. I want to share my screen. I did what everyone with a high IQ does. I Googled it. So I just typed in Polaris. <laughs> That's a little, a little embarrassing. Um, oops. I type in Polaris distance. I got this. And then down here, you know, you got uh, how to find it. You got the Wikipedia article. Apparently, you can find maps to it. But then I got to this North Star closer to the Earth than thought. Space.com. I was like, oh, well, that's. That's cool. I like space.com. I often read articles from space.com. I, I endorse this. So I endorse space.com as a, as a good place to learn about science and so forth, uh, astronomy and so forth. So I clicked it and I read it and read this paper. And yeah, it basically says that the, uh, the distance actually changed dramatically. It changed from, uh, from a previous estimate of about 300 or 434 light years to uh, an estimate of 323 light years. Actually, over here, you can see uh, some of the differences, uh, some of the distances that have been uh, found. Uh, and just so you know, I switched. Uh, I'm going to switch to parsecs instead of light years. And this is where I start to bitch about science communication. Um, problem I have with one of the problems I have with science communication is that it doesn't um, it doesn't communicate right in the sense that astronomers use the term parsec for distances almost exclusively. We really never use the term par uh, light year. The only time we're really ever talking about distances in light years is if we're talking about um, the phenomenon caused by light, like for example, a uh, some kind of time lag across a, a, an AGN disk, we will talk about that distance in light years because the the things that are causing the lag are light related, and that's really <laughs> hand waving. But we use parsecs almost exclusively. Uh, astronomers use the term parsec, which I know is jargon. But, you know, if you use it often enough, it doesn't become jargon anymore. All you really need to know is that a parsec is a measurement of distance that is equivalent to 3.2 or equal to 3.26 light years. The reason why I mention all this is because I'm going to show you my IQ, high IQ process. So I go to this and I see, oh, my God, they actually, you know, they... They found a discrepancy in the distance of roughly 100 light years. That's that's big. That's you know particularly in comparison to the fact that it's only roughly 400 light years on average, depending on who you're talking to. And that this is uh, this article was published in 20, 2012. So not what I would call recent, but it was it's definitely closer than I uh, than I uh, had anticipated. Uh, normally things like this. Normally, we don't see huge shifts like this in astronomy um, uh, these days. When we make, a, uh, when we make shifts, uh, 
they're typically on the smaller order. We're on the order of refining things, not drastically changing uh, cosmology aside. Next problem I have with uh, Polaris uh, or with science communication. Science communication really needs to know that error bars are a thing. Because error bars are really the core of it, the core of it, the crux of whether or not you should answer the question or, or whether answer the question, can I believe this? How much confidence can I give to either one of those values, the 300 or the 400 light year value? I mean, if I go into the literature and I find out that the previous estimate was 323 light years plus or minus 50, and the new one is 330 or 430 plus or minus 25, uh, I'm not going to be that, I'm not going to be that, wow, ooh, because I, I would tell myself, we really didn't know what the distance of Polaris was to begin with, and we still kind of don't. So without that, it's really just sensational. It's really just like, oh my God, we... Polaris has somehow moved. Uh, no, our understanding of where it's of where Polaris was is wrong. And again, without without error bars, I as a a, a layperson really don't understand. Can't under, cannot understand the significance of those two numbers. Like, just how significant is this change given uh, our previous no uh, knowledge? So I'm like, all right, all right just read through and. Um, and I was like, okay. And the thing that space.com usually does, or at least in my, my experience is and one of the reasons why I like them is they'll link the paper because they say, you know, the research is detailed in the astrophysical journal letters and they'll link the paper so I can go to the paper and find out what's going on. Um, they didn't do that. And it, it, if you missed my little rant at the top of the hour and why I'm a little bit irritated at the moment, um, when I was at home last night, I was able to use the information from this and quickly get to the paper I wanted. Not so much tonight, for some reason, which kind of adds to this. Because I was like, um, how am I going to find this? Right? Or how am I going to get this? So what I did was I was like, all right, Turner. Uh, David Turner is the principal investigator. And it's published in Astrophysical Letter, Astrophysical journal letters and it was published this part uh, is in november of 2012 so what was my next stop uh my next stop was to go to nasa ads favorite one of the greatest websites that yeah as an astronomer or as a scientist ads Bloody brain. So I put in Turner. Huh? E. With a little carrot, because that means that it's going to sort by papers that he is the first author of. And I'm like, all right, well, I don't know when this was. I know it, that particular article was 20, 2012. So I'm like, maybe it was published earlier than that. So let's go with 2011 to 2012. Uh, and I go through here. I know it's AppJ, which is APJ. Uh, I go through here. Really not finding it. I find this, which if you click on it, just talks about the fact that the period of Polaris seems to be changing, which is inter interesting upon itself, but doesn't really have anything to do with the distance question. Um, do, do, do. Bottom line, I don't find it. So I then say, all right, how about Polaris? Yeah. Right, I actually need to cheat because I forgot which paper uh, no? Yep, I actually forgot. The, <laughs> oh, and it continues. Um, I forgot the way that I did this. Ultimately, ultimately what I found was I went through this and I found 
uh, that tour. Uh, I looking through here, and I actually found a paper from. Oh yeah, I actually had to not use ads. I had to actually put in. I actually Google search Polaris distance astrophysical letters, and I came down here and I found this, which is the precise distance to uh, a precise distance to the nearest sea feed from Gaia. And that is where I found the paper. There. All right. Enough of my bitching. Enough of my bitching. That people really care about that. But that's kind of what the, the my high IQ research looks like. And what, I, what I'm... Well, I'll get there. I'm already rambling. Let's see if I can stop rambling. So I look at this paper, and um, yeah, so what, what happened is that what he's comparing, what Turner is doing, what Turner has done is Turner has found a new distance using a completely different method than the uh, previous basically accepted method which was done by the, the satellite Hipparchus. Now the satellite Hipparchus uses trigonometric parallax uh, to geometrically find where these objects are. And it has done, and Hipparchus had a catalog of you know, hundreds of thousands of, I think it was hundreds of thousands of stars. Uh, and it was basically the go-to reference for any kind of, uh, for the distances of any kind of stars that were within 100 parsecs, um, because, uh, or, or so, because the distance, typically, if you get further out, uh, the dimmer the star is, uh, and the larger the error bar is to that. So canonically, you don't really trust anything beyond uh, 100 parsecs, unless the error bars are, are convincing enough. So, I, um, so he's comparing his distance, and so he was looking at, uh, he derived a distance completely different from that trigonometric parallax that uh, Hipparchus came up with. Now, how, I, how do I want, why am I going on all of this? What, what is the reason for all of this? The reason is because I want to illustrate that this is, in my opinion, a very good uh, demonstration of how science is done. Now, Hipparchus made all these uh, made all these um, the computed all these distance or rather took all of these measurements and from those measurements uh, the Europeans calculated distances to all of these let's say hundreds of thousands of stars back in 1997. So you can see that here. That's this reference. Um, and what it's showing is, again, in layman speak, this is the, uh, it found an initial uh, distance of this, which is milli arc seconds, which again is, it has to do with, um, has to do with how parallax works. I will be making a video specifically on distance measurement, so hopefully that will make sense later on, but I don't, really don't want to get too bogged down into the, the weeds here. What I want to point out is that 1997, it, it came up with a distance measurement of 7.56 plus or minus 0.48 milli arc seconds. It was 10 years later that a gentleman by the van, uh, name of Van Leeuwen actually looked at the way that those distances had been previously calculated and realized that they were in error. Because what was happening was that... Um, we have multiple ways, in, or in certain cases, we have multiple ways to measure the distances to things, as apparently we do in the case of Polaris. And for a, a disturbingly large number of, of stars, the distances that Hipparchus was giving and the hip distances that people were finding with other methods were discrepant. So something was going on. Um, and, and then finally, Van Leeuwen in 2007 looked at how the uh, how the Europeans were in, uh, analyzing it initially and realized they were they were off they're, they're basically their 
there was a systematic error in their analysis that they were not taking taking into account, and he did, and so he recalculated to that the distance now is uh, 7.54 plus or minus 0.11 milliard seconds. Again, the error bar is now much smaller. Um, and really, you can see that uh, the distance really isn't all that discrepant. It goes from 7.56 to 7.54. But like I said, there was this notice that the distances that Hipparchus was giving were incongruent with or inconsistent with other distance measurements. So as good scientists, or as a good scientist, Van Leeuwen said, wait a minute, I need the, the method is sound. Trigonometric parallax, the methodology is there. It's it works. So why am I getting why are these uh, valid why are these values so off compared to these other techniques that are also physically valid and rigorous? And so he looked at it and he was able to find this out. Ultimately, what this means is that when we get back to normal units, uh, we find that um, uh, Polaris, Van, uh, the Parkus finds that the, the distance to Polaris is 133 point plus or minus two parsecs. Error bar, really small, really good measurement. Fantastic. Um, and now, just to kind of skip away for a moment, what that's what um what that's what Hipparchus found. Now Turner, through his analysis of essentially the the light characteristics of Polaris, is he found a distance that was ninety nine point on uh, ninety nine plus or minus two parsecs. So it was much closer. Turner found it to be much closer using uh, analysis of the star's spectra as opposed to analysis of the star's parallax. Perfectly valid method. Uh, it's perfectly valid method. The science, is, uh, the science is good. Again, the error bar is really tiny. So I was like, wow, this is a little bit odd. Now, what, what space.com uh, fails to say what I was told, what was failed to uh, fail, what was not communicated to me when someone told me, hey, uh, Polaris's distance was wrong, uh, or they found a new distance for it, um, was that that distance, that distance that Hipparchus found, actually caused the problem. Again, I won't, really, I won't go too into, uh, into the weeds with this. Uh, I will be on uh, science uh, on my next coffee in science. I will talk about, or either then or some other time, I will um, create a a topic just about, like I said, uh, distance uh, distance measurements techniques, specifically C feed variables or variable stars. How how do we get the distance to a star based on how quickly it's it's pulsating? Um, so, but the interesting thing about this is that the Hipparchus distance, the original, um, distance everyone was hanging their hat on, didn't agree with certain other observations that were made about Polaris. Um, so Polaris is a seafood variable. It, it goes through a, in, in its lifetime, its internal chemistry is going to change to the point that it's going to pulsate at a regular interval. It's doing so now. As the star evolves, it's going to move into this region of pulsation. It's going to evolve out of this region of pulsation. It's then it's going to go back, and then it's going to go back, and it's going to keep doing that for a couple, three times. That distance would seem to indicate that Polaris is on, uh, is on its like third or fourth trip through the pulsation, uh, through that instability strip or that region of pulsation. But it's period and it's and basically it's light uh how bright it is and other characteristics tell us no actually it um it should only be going through it first i mean it should be just now going into that stage it's a very small amplitude uh pulsation so it's uh polaris is not a is not hugely pulsating that's why it, it appears really steady in the night sky because it's 
because um, the amplitude of pulsation is so small that you really need a digital camera or some kind of photograph, photographic evidence to really to measure it. But that's the thing, is that first distance was in conflict with other evidence. And that was kind of an open question or a crisis of sorts of, again, we have, we have one measure that indicates to us, that tells us from its distance, that, uh, that Polaris should be this type of star. But we see from everything else that, no, Polaris should be this type of um, uh, pulsating variable. And leave it at that. That's that was not communicated with to me. All that well they communicated to me was that the distance had changed. Well, the distance changed because there was that question, there was that um, that crisis, as it were. The problem, and so it it this is uh, Polaris needed to be looked at again to figure out, to solve, to answer that question, to figure out why there was that, that crisis. Now, there's a problem with Polaris in, in doing this, uh, particularly in terms of uh, trigonometric parallax, is, <clears throat> excuse me, as we, as our technology gets better, and uh, as our precision for measuring the positions of things in the night sky gets better, which is what you need for measuring trigonometric parallaxes. Um, it begins to limit us in how bright we can see objects. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Hey, Jeff. Uh, glad you uh, glad you were here. Um, just kind of expressing my uh, I'm trying to build a narrative of how science is taught. So. Uh, We'll see how it goes. Maybe the summary will work better. Um, so where was it? Oh yeah. So, um, kind of irritated for some reason. I don't know why. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, but yeah, what, where was I going with this? So what, what I was going with is that the the better techniques that we have, it. Um, the better cameras that we have, and more specifically, the larger telescopes that we use, it actually causes us to lose um, a region of, of the sky that seems sort of counterintuitive. James Webb, James Webb, um, satellites like James Webb, satellites like Gaia, which replaced uh, Hipparchus, they have what we call a, a brightness limit. So normally, like with my telescope, with the 32-inch the telescope that we have here, we're mostly limited by a faintness limit to the point that there are, we can only see objects down to a certain brightness uh, because of uh, the bright uh, the size of our telescope. But these telescopes and uh, James Webb and, uh, and like I said, Gaia, which is going to become relevant in a moment, they have a brightness limit, meaning that if the star they're looking at is of a certain brightness or brighter, they can't get any good data on it because the camera literally saturates. It's so bright that as soon as the light hits that, uh, that camera, or light hits that chip, doesn't matter how quickly you shut that exposure off, you have now filled up the entire basically well of light that that camera can um, can measure. So it, what this means, what saturation means is uh, you cannot accurately tell, you cannot accurately say how much light you have now received. You've only given it a max, maximum value. An example of that is another way of looking at that is think of a, think of part of that camera, that pixel uh, where the light gets hit. As a, uh, as a bucket, and it can only hold 65,000 photons. So as soon as you open that thing up, that well, 65,000 photons, and every second, every moment later, it's more photons are trying to get in. But because the bucket is only uh, only has room for 65,000, that's how much you're going to measure all the time. 
doesn't matter how many more hit, it only can measure 65,000. So you can't get an accurate measurement of how much light is actually coming off of that star because your, your bucket is full. So there's this brightness limit. So now Polaris uh, and many bright stars like it uh, are actually too bright to look at with really high resolution instruments because they're just too bright. So, I th and I think this is why the, 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 this problem, this sort of crisis with Polaris uh, wasn't, uh, took so long to, to resolve. And initially, when I was going to do this, I was going to just basically go over that um, bringing up Polaris as a way to say that uh, astronomy cannot be trusted actually is kind of a, it, it backfires. Because what it does, what this Turner article has shown, is that um, it's shown that there was more to the the Polaris story, that there were unanswered questions about Polaris, and that now with this new distance measure, this closer distance measure, the star um, the star is now that question is answered. Essentially, when the star is at that distance it looks like a, uh, a, a pulsating variable or a feed variable that's just getting into its pulsating region or instability strip, just starting its trip on the, it's just starting its um, phase or lifespan on the instability. I'm losing my words. I can't, can't figure it out. Um, I was like, so, you know, this actually is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. This is not a, this is not evidence to not trust astronomers. This is evidence to trust astronomers because we are doing science. We saw something that was still in question, and we went back, took better measurements or different measurements, and you know, were able was able to answer that question. Now, unfortunately, <laughs> part of my irritation on this is because I found this out like five minutes before I came live. Um, is I found this which was in 2018 um and basically it flips the script um gaia which is the which is hipparchus on steroids uh, now using gaia uses the same technique different analysis but same technique of trigonometric parallax as hipparchus did but now Gaia is able to do it for a range, uh, for stars of a certain range in brightness from here, uh, from Alpha Centauri out to uh, the edge of the, of the, uh, the Milky Way galaxy. So instead of now knowing only the, dis only the distances to hundreds of thousands or millions of stars, we now know the distances uh, fairly accurately for hundreds of millions, if not billions of stars. Well, like I said, Gaia has a brightness problem. Gaia could not look at Polaris because it would just basically bloom out and it, it, you couldn't find a very specific center to Polaris, which is needed if you're going to measure, the, uh, measure these things. So it just couldn't be done. But somebody was, was smart enough to say, wait a minute, Polaris is a binary. So... What we can do is we can't look at Polaris, but we can look at its buddy, um, Polaris B, which is eighth magnitude. So Polaris itself, I think is listed here, is, hey, I was right, second magnitude, really bright, at least naked eye. Polaris B is eighth magnitude, means you can't see it with your naked eye. So they're like, wait a minute, we can look at Polaris B, and if these this is a binary, then they're going around each other. They should be basically in the same spot in, in space. So, and they and Gaia found a distance of 137, um, well, 137.14 parsecs, which is essentially in line with Hipparchus. Um, kind of in line with 
buying it in line with uh, HST, although eh, I don't really trust that. Uh, so now we're kind of back where we started from. <laughs> Is that, um, and I they did write a paper, or will be writing a paper, as they claim in here, to, uh, they claim that this new Gaia, um, Gaia measurement, uh, Gaia distance, which is now, again, more in line with uh, the Hipparchus distance, actually does solve that whole what type of Cepheid is Polaris. Um, and, but this is an announcement. Now, this is a note. This is not the paper itself. And I can't seem to, and I didn't have time before coming onto the, onto the stream to find that paper and to read it and to, to share that with, uh, with you folks. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> Point I'm trying to make here is, um, yes, there was a, dis there was a problem with the distance to Polaris. Apparently there still may be a problem with the distance to Polaris, but that shouldn't be used as a way to say, oh, astronomers can't be trusted. They don't know what the hell they're doing. They keep flip-flopping on, on saying one thing and then saying another, um, but then saying another and all that good stuff. If you actually look into what's happening, if you actually look into what the research is, where the research is going, these flip-flops are motivated by physical, re or are motivated by questions. There are, we get a distance, we then compare that distance to other characteristics of the star, namely the period of pulsation, how bright it is, things of that nature. And what we're ultimately trying to do is we're trying to get an overall description of the star. And from the and the question became, and then when we got that distance and that from Hipparchus, and then when we got that description from other other places, that didn't match. That our description of the of the star was not consistent given all of that data so we had to go back and they did and they thought they had they they thought they had gotten day on day that was consistent um then they went back again and uh now we're getting a different answer um but apparently these folks uh scott angle and and co uh scott angle at all i should say uh, they seem to think that this new distance actually does solve that makes a more consistent picture of uh, Polaris. So, um, so yeah, so this is how science works. This is how, why science can be trusted is because we don't throw our hands up and basically say, all right, that's it. That's the number. That's, that's the distance. We're done. Um, we're constantly looking at uh, what do these numbers mean? What do these distances indicate? What do they what do they what do they say about the overall description of whatever it is we're looking at? If we're looking at the distance to a star, what does it tell us about what that star is? Um, if we're looking at the distances to galaxies, what about what does that tell us about the state of that galaxy now or how it evolved? We're constantly asking these questions. And when all these answers are inconsistent with the answers that other experiments or observations are giving us, then we don't just, again, throw our hands up and basically say, no, you're wrong, I'm right. No, you're wrong, I'm right. We do more experiments. We do more observations to, um, to figure it out, that sort of thing. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's basically all I had to say on that. Um, um, so, hmm. so hi, um, hi, howdy, Chris, Judy, Jeff, thank you all for being here with me tonight. Uh, again, I, I do apologize for my mood. I'm, uh, that whole, uh, not being able to find things and not being as prepared for this live stream as I wanted to, is uh, kind of got me in a mood. So, uh, Uh, let me do something real quick. I want to see if I can coax um, one of these flat earthers to come up on come up onto the screen with me. Uh, 
have a child. And for you for for anyone uh, in, in the for you folks, Zach, that is the invitation as well. So if you wanna you you wanna come on in and um, shoot the poop with me, uh, that I it is uh, there is the link to do it. So now uh, there was another thing I wanted to to, to go off about. Oh, let me throw this link in somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, Third hand, uh, second hand. I really, um, <laughs> I, I, I know it seems like I'm, I'm bad mouthing Austin Lexington and, and claiming that he is saying things that he may not, in fact, be claiming. But this is what people are telling me that he is doing. The most recent thing is this nonsense. Uh, let's see. Do I have to explain? I am. I'm going to go to Discord here. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, there it is. Okay. Let's pop that baby out. Um, and I think this actually might be a healing moment for our community. Um, ah, it doesn't work. I just, oh, yeah. Um, oh, sorry to hear that, Chris. Thank you for uh, for being here. Uh, I hope you get uh, your 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 throat and sinuses get better. Hey, no problem. And and yes, thank you for being here for my two streams. I, I very, very much appreciate it. Yeah, yeah whatever. So Good night. So, um, I, uh, I was, I was on Blue Marbles server, and I can't remember who posted this. Uh, I was just looking at it, so I should have. But somebody on Blue Marble well, posted the link to this. This is audit.nasa.com. Um, and this is where the, the where the healing the healing can truly begin is that you know for a while our community or the community that I paid attention to we were all you know the flat earth debunkers just basically talking about you know, how, what flat earth was kind of arguments they had that sort of thing and then you know a good number of folks got bored with it. And a good number of folks got, uh, folks got bored at laughing at flat earthers, and so they decided to go laugh at auditors uh, or frauditors or whatever, these First Amendment um, uh, folks. I have no interest in them. I don't know why folks find them to be so much more fascinating than uh, people who think the earth is flat, but I don't know. You know, to each their own. Who am I to King Shane? So. Where, why do I think this is going uh, this is going to bring everybody in well this is not this is auditnasa.com this is a site purportedly created by Witsit, possibly others but it was told to me that this is that Wits, uh, Austin Witsit is behind this site and it's asking people to become NASA auditors become a NASA auditor today is NASA actually going to space? Here is the mission statement. 
Um, it was NASA audits was founded with the belief that transparency and accountability are fundamental principles to a de uh, democratic society. Here, here. We believe that the National Aeronautics and Space Administration has a responsibility to be forthcoming and transparent with their information, documents, evidence, and evidence related to their claims of space exploration. Our team of experts, experts, including scientists, engineers, lawyers, researchers, and independent journalists, or our team of, oh, our team of experts includes, sorry, I can read, um, include scientists, engineers, so forth and so on. We are dedicated to providing courses and information to help hold NASA accountable to the public. Oh, by the way, it does have a chat bot. I have a question. Let's see what happens. Is the Earth flat? Ugh. So apparently it wants my name and email address in order to uh, to answer that question. Um, no, thank you. I think anyone who knows me, you know, if, if you are of Flat Earth or if you are a NASA auditor, you know how to get in touch with me, obviously, because you're watching my, uh, my live stream or my this video. So, yeah, it, there is a chat bot. On it's, again, it's going to ask me for name and email. It doesn't have a straight answer. Um, and apparently, I can't ask another one. Oh well, so much for that. So and then we have our standard commitment to excellence, da, da, da. and of course, merch. In seven, in basically a week. You will have, you will have the opportunity to buy NASA audits merch. I can't wait. I don't know about you, but I, I certainly can't wait. What is involved in a NASA audit? Some audits we perform include employee phone interviews, in-person interviews, uh, da, 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 First Amendment audits. Basically going to NASA facilities with a camera, walking around until someone tells you, why do you have, or someone comes up to you and asks you, why do you have a camera? Please stop filming me. And then you say no and cops show up. Interviewing astronauts. So, wow, all right. So that is what's involved in a NASA audit. What services do they apply? Uh, uh, what services does NASA audits provide? This is kind of what I'm, interested in here is the auditing courses. So this website purports to say that they will teach you how to audit, how to do all of this stuff. All right. Um, is NASA required to be cooperative? Uh, essentially, yes. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, what can I do to help? Sign up for our newsletter, donate to the cause, purchase courses, uh, courses and merchandise. I'm very interested to know what this course is. A, who teaches it? Two, what are they actually teaching me? Are they teaching me interview skills? Are they teaching me how to um, dive into the interwebs to find people's home phone numbers? Um, what is it they're actually trying to teach me? Or what what can they teach me? The part of this that I found to be, that really tickled my fancy, actually, was this part here. Uh, say something interesting about your business here. Uh, what's something exciting about your business offer? Say it here. Uh, under auditing courses. So, obviously, this is a... This is under construction. Join the mailing list. Join our team. I'm really attached resume. I'm really, really tempted. I am really tempted to apply. Um, and I, I, I don't. 
And the reason why I don't apply, the reason why uh, that I really, that I don't want to is because I don't agree with them. I don't agree with, I mean, I agree in principle that not on NASA, as with any space agency or any government agency, they need to be held accountable. Yes, I, I fully agree with it. Fully agree with that. Um, but if this is going to be what the first, oh, like frauditors do, what the First Amendment auditors do, no, thank you. That's not that's not auditing. That's harassment. Um, so, uh, so my only so my purpose for joining this would be just to kind of point and laugh, mostly point, not laugh, but so it, it would disingenuous of me to to apply. Uh, and considering I'm making this video, there is a possibility someone might see it. Yeah, see, Judy, I, I'm wondering about that. That's my that's really the ultimate curiosity is could I would they accept me? Would by looking at what uh who I am, if I gave them my CV, would they would they accept me as an as an auditor? Um, because on one hand, you know, I'm an astronomer. I got the in, so you know, they might look at that as an asset. But on the other hand, I'm an astronomer. I have potentially gotten funding from NASA, so who knows? But at this point, I think I have enough notoriety, not much, really at all. Um, I think, but I have enough notoriety that someone somewhere might tell these folks who I am. Um, and that would, I think that would bias, bias this. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Appreciate that. Never really thought of myself as funny, but I appreciate that. That makes me feel better. Um, so, but yeah, that got brought to my attention uh, that this exists. Um, apparently there's also a blog. Oh, we have a Dan. Uh, let me fix my audio. I can't hear you if I'm on. I can't hear it. I can hear you, but barely. For controls. Edit audio. Let's see. How about you folks out there in the interwebs land? Can you, uh, how well are you hearing? I think Dan? I got everything on. I'm not sure why I can't hear you. Oh, I don't think he can hear Checking settings. Audio default. And I got you now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. How how are you? I'm doing all right. You, I missed I missed your earlier stream. I jumped in here um, to say hi. I saw you were going through Austin site, and I haven't I haven't gone through it. You know, to pick it apart. I'm glad you did. I brief I briefed through it, and I just I don't. You know, it's it's new. It's different, and I just want to give you a little background, like. He's been killing a lot of time on Discord, and I'm like, dude, you sh you need to get off of Discord and try and find at least on YouTube you can make super chats, you know, money. And so, having very few income opportunities, he this is really a form of activism that he can ask us to take part in. Okay, and, and it was definitely my first idea. You know, is like we need to aggravate people about how their how their money is being spent in the case of nasa in particular now prior to artemis you know they hadn't done shit in 60 years so it was pretty easy to bug them really you know especially after abandoning the shuttle so um i'd like to give him credit a little bit for trying to do something he doesn't have any product he doesn't have a book he doesn't have anything else and they're easy to pick on so I think this was probably a good idea, but it is a form of um, a call to arms to ask the people to help. And maybe it seems disruptive, but I, I need to just say one thing in all realism. 
right. the the closing speech for Eisenhower when he left office, you know, in 61, he absolutely stated whether the power was given or taken that he, uh, I think the quote was beware of the military industrial complex. Yeah. And that yeah. it had gotten beyond management from a governmental level. It basically is what he was saying. And, um, I think this is a 60 year old problem that uh, I think I'm losing you, Dan. Is the problem me or Dan? Uh, folks in the chat, can have we lost? Have you lost me, or you have lost Dan? It's not as refreshed as you think. It's... All right, let me let me uh, send him a message on Discord. Uh, oh, I want to remove. Okay, trying to get him back on here. Uh, yes, I can. I can see you. Great. All yes. right. So it is pretty goofy looking, but in concept, it's it's very American. Sure. <laughs> I think we lost him again. All right. Um, before. Ah, oh, there he is. Maybe I can do this. Um, before you uh, go on, I do. Uh, I don't know if you um, saw my. I, I think I pinged you about this. Uh, I had uh, the author of this book, Operation Moonglow, uh, give a, a talk here at George Mason. This is a book about, and she, uh, the author, is Teasel, Doctor Teasel Muir Harmony. She is the Smithsonian director or the director of the Smithsonian uh, Apollo exhibit. So all things Apollo, she is the curator for. Um, she wrote this book, and this book is an insight on the political, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Why, basically, why the politicians got involved with the space race. Uh, essentially, what was, uh, what was it for them? When I read this, I thought immediately of you. I, I recommend you pick that up. But what I want to talk about, though, is, so we got this... Um, so we've got this site. Um, so it, it, I want to make sure it is Austin Witson. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. And I think it's the first thing he's done where he was really, you know, had any kind of, you know, we don't, he's, he doesn't have a physical product except for, you know, maybe the junk merchandise that everyone has. Right. But um, I think this is a way to get people to rally around something. I think that's a big problem for flat earthers in particular. And maybe this is a way to attract uh, other people that aren't um, into being flat earthers. Yet See, they're I, still feeling there's something going on. Yeah. you. I remember the, the from our last conversation online, um, you had mentioned that flat earth for you is sort of like the billboard for other conspiracies. We're looking deeper into uh, you know, government malfeasance. Uh, the thing that surprised me about this was that, um, you know, I, I'm familiar with Austin stuff for a long time, and he has never been a. He's never his shtick has never been NASA. He's always been about flat Earth. Now he's about the electric universe. Uh, so when I when I saw this, I was surprised that. Um, Austin created this, but it, as it sounds 
what you're selling me is that he's done, done this essentially as a money making scheme on top of uh, potentially recruiting folks. Yeah. Yeah, you're back. So his shtick had, had never been. Stig had never been been NASA. He, as far as I know, I could be wrong. Yeah. Oh. Yep. I'm here. That's a lot of Okay, I lowered my definition on the camera to increase bandwidth. So that's a okay. good trick. If you need to do that, try that. Maybe I'll stick, I can stick around that way. Sweet. Yeah, so I was wondering what your summary of it was. I didn't hear you summarize. I was trying to quickly catch up by hearing little bits of you and watching you go through pages. Because to tell you the truth, I didn't really pay attention to it. I heard someone else was donating to it. So I think people are trying to take a part in something. But flat earthers are desperate to take part in something. We don't have much. So I actually commend them for this. You don't. Well, hold on. Let's see. Uh, maybe I need to. Uh, camera. I will lower my definition. Maybe that will help. Oh yeah, uh, I've I've heard that too, which is which to me is. Um, just laughable because I complain about NASA's budget, but from the opposite side of things. Um, but anyway, um, where was I going with it? So you wanted to, so what do I think of this? Uh, uh, I, well, I, I, I mean, I'm sure you think it's out there, you know, well, and it, it, might, it might be, it might be, uh, but it was definitely my first reaction was you know these are the culprits i know it's not really true and you know but the, it's the only problem. because it's mm -hmm. only because they've spread it out so much they farmed it out so much it's not just nasa anymore Ooh, what's that uh he has three blog um, blog posts uh the national basically the commissioning of nasa um our commitment to excellence and our standard at nasa audits um I haven't read this yet, although this looks basically what he had just put on his on the site. Um, I don't know what to say about this. Um, I, I I know what you mean about the First Amendment audits. Those guys are kind of a nuisance. I mean, they're assholes, if, really. if you find yourself in that situation, that's a hell of a lot different. If you're a real reporter, that's a lot different. Yeah. But if you're going to look for trouble, you can find it pretty easy. And if you think it's glorious to be uh, trespassed from somewhere you didn't belong to begin with and didn't expect to come back, it's not much of an achievement. You know, their, yeah. their biggest hope is getting mauled or attacked by someone that loses their cool and then they could sue someone. Yeah. So, so I, my, my fear is um, because is who are they going to audit? Because I, in this case, I actually have a vested interest because I have friends who work at NASA. Um, so when it really depends on what they mean by audits, which is why I was very curious to know what these courses were about, because what are, what are these courses going to tell people to do? Like, are they going to tell them to look up these folks' home addresses and home phone numbers and bother them at home? Um, you know, how are they going to actually go about, um, uh, performing these these audits in a legitimate way rather than in a sort of First Amendment auditor money-grubbing sort of way. Let me stretch it really far. 
Okay. Let's say that we are a global um, community and we do have people in other countries and we could compare media releases and even budgets. And, you know, is it so there is some comparing that could be done without digging deep and just you know, are the stories the same? You and I know how we both feel about um, the clickbait headlines. Yeah. And, you know, uh, can we control that? You know, you don't see a reason for it. I'm outraged by it. So that's just kind of a difference of opinion. Um, but there is quite a bit of salesmanship and, um, involved in uh, the campaigns and outreach of, the, of NASA. And I'd be hard pressed. I mean, my gut feeling says that the $58 million a day goes to the United Nations as hush funds and that the real funding here okay. is generated uh, either behind the scenes through through DOD and the NRO or um, think about how much money they make commercially. You know, think about as an enterprise, I'm sure they make a lot of money, you know, selling product and tours and, yeah, and through these campaigns. Sure. So, are these campaigns legit? Are they really, how much is spent on frivolous stuff like space hotels that aren't going to happen and things we don't really need? And I, and I don't think NASA is planning on spending money on a, spo on a space hotel. That's going to be completely, um, a completely private venture. True. Um, and which, which actually, um, you know, on Blue Marbles, I got this site from someone on Blue Marble and one of the, one of the first reactions to it was why not spacex spacex audits um why is this only limited to nasa i mean if we're talking about whether or not we've been to space whether or not uh you know there's been funding we've been to space and people are telling us the truth then why are we just limiting it to nasa and not say hey, the esa or spacex or what have you hey bloom Blue, if you'd like to come on, um, I think the link is in the. Uh, I think I put the link in your Discord. Well, you're yeah. you're 100 right, um, except that NASA is what people know. It's almost like asking for a Kleenex versus a facial tissue, or playing with a frisbee for any round disc. You know, some some names stick. I still call the problem of. Um, space accountability nasa too but i feel that they've subbed everything out to private you know privatization at this point um even artemis was such a frankenstein of leftover stuff from years ago um i'm surprised they even used it to tell well, you it's, it's see it's funny that you should say that because it seems to counter the the money argument because the reason why artemis is such a wow. hodgepodge is because they don't have the funding to really invest into whole lots of new technology. That's so, an excellent point, and you're 100% right. That's why I think some of their funding comes elsewhere. Some of the funding is through private industry and military budget, you know, secret budget, what, well, what they call it, black, black programs. Yeah. So I, I think you're totally right about that. I mean, and SpaceX, the SpaceX exists because, partly because NASA doesn't get the money that they need for massive space exploration. Um, and you're right. I mean, we're seeing we're seeing it right in front of us that NASA is literally farming out uh, to our farming out jobs to product to private uh, to private sectors. SpaceX is going to be the one supposedly to to build the reusable module to get us to moon, the moon and back. So in that sense, you are you are correct. But And, and you made a better that, point. You made a better point. It had to have come up in Congress where they went, no, 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 no. What did you do with this? What are you doing with that? In other words, most of the audit, ad, auditing had to have happened during the Artemis program. You know, because they obviously put the brakes on spending during that. Um, yeah. And, and with the uh, again, I go going back to to this book, uh, Teasel's book. Um, exactly. You know what's what I found to be very interesting in it is I knew that I knew that NASA funding was larger 
during the Apollo program than uh, than it is now. What I didn't know is that it is the largest or the most expensive uh, uh, United States or American project that has ever been built. More than the Hoover Dam, more than the TVA, more than the interstate system combined. The height of at the height of the uh, the Apollo program, the budget for NASA was four percent the GDP. Now it's around 0.04% of the GDP. And she mentions at the very end that basically at, after Nixon, um, for the life of me, who came in after Nixon, that would be Ford. Um, after Nixon, we won the space race, so there was no need to spend that kind of money anymore. And so hence why NASA basically got defunded, um, which is where we are now. So I guess it's another way, a long-winded way of saying that you know, when I hear these claims that NASA is making 58, however many millions of dollars a day, I mean, yes, but we've definitely given them more in the past. And really, it's not a huge amount when compared to the GDP of this country. But they've learned to fund from the side. I have documents on me going back to 62 talking about um, the, the National Reconnaissance Community and the CIA pressuring NASA to put up their weather satellite before the TV satellite because they they had already you know put in their uh, reconnaissance capabilities into it, and they were saying at the bottom of the document, "Don't worry about the monies. We're we'll get paid back." In other words, they had already created the entire satellite. And that was in the, in the outside of NASA's uh, funding. Yeah. And they said, well, don't worry about it. We'll get paid through other stuff, you know, mm -hmm. basically they were saying. And they, they were applying pressure to the agency. I think the agency's slowdown um, doesn't show the United Launch Alliance alongside of it. And because of funding, because of these fiscal reasons, we don't know of the ULA, you know, with 150 successful missions, you know, with a perfect record. Well, they had enough money to have a perfect record. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they're not, you know, glorified the same way because they don't have the marketing campaign, you know, and there is a lot of marketing here. So oh, on, sure. on one hand, it'd be fun if they got anything done. On the other hand, you're probably right. Most of that did get done during the Artemis gear up where they yeah. put real breaks on extra on extraordinary spending. And re, there had to have been reviews of the entire program oh. that were serious and throughout and thorough top to yeah. bottom. Yeah. Essentially the, um, you know, the Apollo program from a political standpoint was really a weapon in the arsenal against the cold war against the Soviets. And once the Soviets crashed and burned, uh, politicians were no longer really interested in funding uh, NASA uh, to that point, which is why we didn't really go back to the moon. We didn't do the whole shuttle thing, which most people seem to have forgotten about. Um, but I kind of, uh, I, I kind of want to go back to to the whole NASA audits thing. Um, let me ask you this: so I, I can't, I was, I don't know if you uh, heard me talking about this, but I was like, should I apply? Because they're, they say that their mission is to demand transparency and accountability for NASA. I fully, admit, uh, fully agree that uh, any government agency should be transparent and held accountable for their actions. Um, I'm curious whether or not, if I apply, if I send them my CV, would they accept me? I think you have to do it just, just to see. Uh, yeah, that'd be exciting just to know what, what happens. Yeah. Uh, uh, of course, this is going to see what sticks to see if this is around next year anyway, you know? Oh, how so, many, so you, you know, basically think this is just a, um, you know, throwing spaghetti at the wall to find out what sticks? It, this I is think kind of a, it, it, it's non-interfering with anything that he's doing to begin with. It, sure. it doesn't require a shitload of labor anymore once he does this. It, he does some little online things, maybe shows up somewhere. 
for a meeting, some, you know, a conference at times. Um, but mo most importantly, I think he's giving, I know he's giving people a way to support his efforts one way or another. You know, this is a guy that toured the whole country mm -hmm. um, and Brilliant. did not did not promote it well or get a lot of support. Well, and, he also he also they made uh, the unfortunate uh, decision of teaming up with Nathan Thompson. Um, but well, you, you said know, his you said his name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if I, if I say it two more times in the mirror, he'll, he will, he will appear. Um, but. When you say that this is not there's not going to be a, a whole lot of upkeep, I don't know. He's the main thing I'm looking at is the auditing courses. Um, he's got to come up with because you can purchase them. Of course, it doesn't show me. Um, I don't know where you can purchase them. I, he, I guess he hasn't built that yet, but you can apparently purchase these auditing courses and someone will teach you how to conduct a NASA audit. That's that's a lot of upkeep. I mean, not only do you have to produce them, but you have to keep track of who should get them. But honestly, I'm looking at this and I'm wondering whether or not there's a lot of potential for fraud is what I, where I'm really getting into. Mm -hmm. is if folks if folks donate, if folks donate, if folks buy courses, how are these folks going to be know that that money is actually going to go towards NASA auditing rather than just, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's certainly, you know, the case with any donated monies to any cause. Oh, of course. Yeah. But in reality, we have a tough time finding any way to rally around or take action in any way. So I think he's, this is a call to action. Um, okay. Even if they sign up and do nothing, um, we have a hard time getting anyone to mobilize. So if, if he's practicing at mobilizing again, power to him, you know, he's, but when you say, um, when you say mobilizing, do you really think that, um, that Austin's going to take this money and uh, create conferences and use it to do conferences, use it to make tours or, uh, you know, speaking series or, or really anything other than just hanging out on Discord uh, and selling merch. Like, that's where I'm, I'm wondering is you say that it, I, I understand that. You think that Flat Earth needs a larger platform, needs a more aggressive sort of uh, messaging system, I guess. Uh, but do you really think this is it? That this is going to do it? This is different. Okay. Um, therefore, it has value, to, you know, because it's out there to see if it works or not. I've done, you know, I do street activism, and it's almost impossible for me to get people to show up. Mm. So if he got eight people to go to uh, uh, SpaceX on, what do you call it, uh, open house because, mm -hmm. they, because they allowed 35 people for the public and we overran it with requests. It'd be fun, be exciting. You know, um, I've got that within an hour drive of me and also JPL within an hour drive of me. So I feel an obligation to find at least when they're open houses and what they do allow people to do. I spoke to someone else that went down to, to Tesla. Uh, I'm sorry, to SpaceX. There was some railroad tracks nearby and he was poking around and bothered some guy who was outside having a smoke. And it turns out they were having some problem indoors and almost everyone got um, escorted outside to the parking lot areas. And he was badgering people, and he made himself unwelcome very quickly. Hmm. So the idea is not to make yourself unwelcome, um, that's for sure. And uh, the courses, I think he could, if they're on, you know, if their course is basically charting as to how to do uh, auditing, hopefully they don't include, you know, badgering and and guidelines to stay within your bounds and to look for 
an opening instead of trying to wedge your way in, um, you know, like like picnics, yeah. um, com company events, things like that, where we might be actually welcome. Um, badgering people is not a good idea. Uh, I have a hard time telling everyone that about like when you come around, you know, because they want to take everything, all their frustrations on the first person they see of <laughs> any credential authority yeah. or word or something to say. Yeah. And you're so much more valuable than that. In our case, we're having a hard time speaking to professionals at any level and getting near academia. Um, so, so I, yeah, when you, uh, what I find to be interesting, you were saying that uh, you will, when you you do street activism and you were uh, you're saying that it's a hard time to get you people out to actually you know Inform. promote the movement, I guess. Yeah. Um, why? Like okay. when I look at these Discord servers, when I look at Discord um, uh, communities, they seem to be you know a wealth of people, and they are certainly not held back as to what they uh, their opinions. No, but there's no more than 200 of those people. And this is so separate from them. This is him getting the fuck off of Discord. He wastes so much time on Discord. He, I mean, he's honed his skills and he's bounced some stuff, but it's mostly the same stuff over and over again, you know? Yeah. And it's like, for you, when you come around, I'd like to limit it to two hours because in the third hour, people come around that didn't hear what you said before. <laughs> And yeah. you get into a cycle of why this? And you're like, I already said that. I already said I questioned, you know, so just the sheer length of time you spend there, it starts to get redundant. And this is a method for him to get off of there and onto something else. If he does, let's say once a month, a seminar and Q and a regarding the courses, which are all prepackaged, it won't cost him a lot of effort. I mean, this is low, low dollar, low investment, low effort. Now, is there high return? Um, I don't know. What are we going to do? Write a letter? I'm not sure. You're right. I mean, what are we going to do when we find a problem? Uh, he has gone through FOIA and, you know, gotten a couple of documents. Jaron had done that, gotten videos. They're, they're expensive. They make it a little difficult. Um, what are we going to prove? Maybe the green screen stuff, you know, maybe... That, that stuff is often prepared. Okay. And, and of course, as part of the campaign, who gives a shit, right? It's like a commercial. They, yeah. Or how they pre present food in commercials. You know, it's really white glue because the, the uh, frosting would run off, you know, things mm -hmm. like this. So uh, congratulations to NASA for performing the Artemis mission. Uh, congratulations to NASA if they can prove their value, you know, in the future. Yeah. Um, I think this is a way to see who would join any cause. And I think this was the quickest, easiest, and strongest opposition he could find, you know, a cause, okay. you know. So logically, this is good. You know, logically, it's like, well, he's going to get the hell off of uh, – discard and spend some more time on other things. This is just one of the other things. But do you th do you think that's actually going to happen? Because when I look at this, really what I'm looking at is um you know a or what I what I fear is going to happen is that people are just going to hit the just going to go down here, you know, hit ye old donate money or a donate button, give him money and really not open this thing up at all, not do anything up uh, uh, with this at all and really just take people's money. Um, so that's, that's what I'm, that's my fear. And I'm also wondering, is there anyone else involved in this or is it just Austin? Those are excellent questions. Um, it could be the case. It could end up being the case. No one deserves the money more than him about, you know, the amount of time that I've seen him give back and the, um, he, he's relatively calm. He speaks quickly and deliberately, but he, he represents better than anyone I know. His depth is, is probably double of almost anyone else. Um, in my 
my frank opinion of, of Austin is that, yes, he is very well-spoken. He speaks very, very quickly. I think, honestly, that's a tactic. I think it's a very good tactic, but I think that's a tactic to prevent people from, A, truly understanding or being able to um, let's say, or internalize what he's actually saying and, two, to actually uh, interrupt him in, in any way. Uh, but I have to say the stuff that he's been talking about, particularly with electric or uh, the electric universe, it's clear to me that he doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't understand um, electromechanics. He does or electrodynamics, electrostatics rather, magnetism. You know, I had that very brief conversation with him. I don't know if you were there, but I had a very brief conversation with him uh, on that Discord maybe a week ago or so, and then he was going off about how all these distance estimates were wrong and the cosmological crisis. And I kept telling him, you know, your understanding is inaccurate. What you understand is not what you are saying is true. So, um, yes, I, I guess to <laughs> TLDR is, yes, I agree that uh, Austin is very well-spoken and he's very good at what he does. My problem with him is that I don't think he truly knows what he's talking about, at least at the level that he is presenting himself to know what he is talking about, if that makes any sense. Well, when we first saw him, he was decoding Ken Wheeler, since yes. no one can understand Ken Wheeler and at the you know the way the way he speaks and and the brevity in which he moves on. Um, okay, actually, it's very good. Um, if you there's a uh, there a friend of mine goes by AB Science on YouTube. Um, he dissected. He is now a PhD physicist. His uh, his uh, his thesis or his dissertation was on uh, magnetism. I, he told me what it was, but I've forgotten. But he is basically an expert in magnetism. He did an entire series dissecting Ken Wheeler's uh, videos, and I can tell you, Ken Wheeler is it's word salad it doesn't mean anything tell you so um the fact that that austin is dissecting it kind of goes to my point of he doesn't know what he's talking about because if he knew what he was talking about he'd realize that ken wheeler is so full of shit his eyes are brown so lucky that i've heard him talk at all because i think he talks about discrepancies within unification theories more than anything i i don't hear him um we're talking about theories you know we're talking about mm -hmm. things going forward and uh i have you know he's way beyond me in his comprehension of how things might work and the um citation of what physicists and and, and theoretical scientists are looking into particularly the ether you know which has been an argument for what 150 200 years um thereabouts yeah or more i mean i don't know uh, actually he, he says it goes all the way back to the 1600s but well, uh, yeah um so i think at that point you were talking about there there is the term ether but it has been used to mean different things over over you know, at different times for example aristotle was actually the one as far as i know who coined the term ether uh and he referred to ether as the fifth element uh, so you had to him, you had fire, you had earth, you had water, you had all the, you know, avatar elements, and then you had ether. Be and the reason why the, <laughs> the sun and the, the moons and the planets were all made of ether is because those objects didn't move with the same prescription that he applied to everything else on the earth. So ether has been around, the term ether has been around forever, um, since Aristotle, uh, so yeah. Um, also, um, the other area you'll see Austin go is um, into Christianity and Bibles yeah. and Bible and Torah and such. So this is probably a branch of where Austin's going to go with his time and effort and see who he can gather, see what suckers he could gather over there too. Now I'm going to you know say suckers because if you just click donate and get nothing out of it. We could call them that, but I will tell you that the people that sent him money, super chats, you know, um, didn't expect anything back. They were rewarding him for.
for his effort to begin with and for representing them. Going back to Discord, it's a weak sliver of uh, humanity. It's not their online people who are there to fight and play, mm -hmm. fight or play. You know, it's not, you know, nothing's getting done there. And it's, a, and it's an internet world. It's not real world. Um, Austin deserves a ton of credit for entering the real world. You okay. know, so that's a big difference than most of us, you know, that don't go in the street, don't show their face, don't use their real name, and don't try and represent, boy, any cause or anything that he may or may not care about. Okay. You know, so give him a little credit for having guts. And um, I'm trying to keep him away from you because he's going to want to rip you to pieces. And I think you're so much more valuable to us um, because we need more people in, in at your level of uh, not just prestige, but more importantly, personally, you're willing to discuss things. You're willing to question things. You're willing to hypothesize and put up with people lined up next, next, because you're used to, you're used to standing up when people asking questions. So you're, you're very unique. Um, you're not constrained by your employer, which is unique. Um, <laughs> yeah. So far, so, uh, so far, so good. I don't, I don't believe they are aware of my YouTube channel. Department chair is aware of my YouTube channel. I don't know if he's ever watched anything on it, um, but he is aware of it. Um, in terms of uh, keeping me away from uh, from Austin, um, please don't. Actually, I welcome the chances to talk to, uh, to Austin. Okay, all right. Um, I mean, that's good. I just, I just don't want him or anyone else to think they're going to settle it right then and there with you because I think you have more value than that. And what we consider a success is scaring someone off and going, yeah. "Oh, look, he rage quit. He wouldn't listen." Well, really, yeah, yeah. You, you were all lining up and bouncing them around like bullies in an in a call, you know, in an alleyway. Yeah, and it's not. It get, it becomes tiring in hour three, and you just you can't keep up with another round of another guy thinking he's smart. You know, the the thing with uh, with uh, Austin is I've seen him outside of say Discord or where, um, when I've seen him on YouTube videos or what have you. It's always in a debate setting. And what I would like to do is I would just like to have a conversation with the man, um, figure out, um, you know, why he believes the things that he does and he can present his argument because I know that he is very definitive about cosmology. He is very definitive about astronomy in general in such a way that um, he's just wrong. It, it, certain things that he says, he's wrong. And I would love to have a conversation with him to explain to him how he is wrong, <laughs> essentially. Uh, and you know, I don't want to. I don't want to try to convince him that the Earth is round. I never try to convince anyone that the Earth is round. I just want people to know what science says, um, because I don't want people going out there and misrepresenting what current the current science says. Uh, and I find that's what he's been doing. I think he's smart enough to learn from you. I mean, it was fun to hear you talk with us the other day as we brought up subjects in your field you weren't aware of yet. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not out of range for us to teach you, and that's amazing in itself. Yeah. You know I, mean? I, I, I opened this stream by saying, one, uh, by explaining why I do things, and one of the reasons why I engage with uh, Flat Earth is I learn stuff. And I like learning stuff like the, the Polaris thing, the fact that the, the distance has changed fairly recently. Um, and I looked into that and apparently I still need to look into that. because What a, what a funny source to have it come out of us, you know? Yeah. Um, so but that's part of your outreach. In other words, your outreach is working. If it's bringing data back to you, your outreach is working. So if we give money to you in outreach, are we expecting physical return for us or just supporting you? you know? So, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I know that I have two patrons from a practical standpoint. I know I have two patrons. Um, is, I haven't checked to see if anyone has joined me, uh, has been donating to me recently, but I, as I explicitly state every time, uh, every time I shill it, I guess, 
is that all of that pro, all of that money goes to our observatory and um, our tour guide, paying our tour guides and things of that nature. So if someone wants to see what we where that money would go, I'm very willing to show them. And actually, one of the things I want to be able to do is to do a stream where I show our guides out in out in the world, you know, teaching kids about astronomy. So, um, so yeah, that's why I um. So yeah, I do plan on I do plan on showing people, you know, the fruits of their labor as it were. Well, so, not only that, um, you reached out to me, so mm -hmm. your your outreach program went above and beyond what anyone would expect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I just um, like I said, I want to. Uh, I'm very curious about the flat earth, as you know, uh, I'm very curious to know. I would really love to talk to, to Gio to find out exactly what life experiences he has to, that have led him to believe, uh, led him to the conclusion rather that the earth is, uh, is flat. Um, and um, with Austin, the same thing. It's just, like I said, the problem I have with Austin and this whole thing, getting back to the Austin or the audits thing is, you know, I'm, I'm afraid it's just going to be a, uh, a it's going to be a dodge. It's going to just be a way to take money out of the hands of people who really shouldn't be taken advantage of. And um, uh, I think he misre misrepresents things. Um, definitely different than whatever he's doing with this NASA audits thing. So you got two things going on with him, really, in that case. You know, one is conversing and and going over differences and the other would be what the hell are you doing with this you know you rabble rouser <laughs> uh, um, wonder where he is right now you, you, you don't want to bring him on now if i find him do you if you find him and he's willing to come on now i would love to have him on uh he's not listening he's server uh he's got his audio off he's got a young baby right now yeah i heard about that i heard about that so, you know, what would you do to, uh, if you were Mr. Terrific Flat Earther, you know, what would you do to uh, try and figure out a way to make money? In other words, um, they've tried to do an online conference, him and Jaron, something they called uh, True Earth as a way to attract people. The big thing now is to attract people that don't get tagged as Flat Earthers. It's so ugly to be tagged as a flat earther. Mm -hmm. um, and to, so, be limited, to be limited as such, actually. I mean, I guess uh, my question then would be, why does this need to be a... Because it sounds to me like you're uh, saying that this should be a career, that people should make money doing this. Um, shouldn't they just be doing this out of their own pocket. I mean, if they, I mean, obviously uh, they, I have yeah. no problem with asking for donations, no. but. Until it becomes 24 um, seven, Jaron, when he uh, had a new baby a few years ago, realized that if he could get just two bucks out of the same people he was getting a dollar out of, that he could go from 1500 bucks a month to $3,000 a month and no longer have to try and get a job. More importantly, to have his wife be able to be at home and have her not out delivering foods and whatever, you know, Uber driving, okay. you know, so. Um, oh, one second. Uh, Timbo Turtle, I think, is, was trying to connect but can't anymore. Um, so, Timbo, if you're out there, let me know and I'll fix that. But so, yeah, so you're saying that um, Jaron was basically saying, if I can make more money out of it, I'm making money on this. If I can make more money on this, then my wife doesn't have to work. And uh, not so much that, but he wouldn't have to work. Um, mm. And he was putting in the work. Uh, that particular guy is a journalist, you know, and he's done good. I didn't that. realize that was his background. Uh, it's not his background. It's his specialty. You know, okay. he's he's done good as that. And he hasn't. Um, he's not a scientist, you know, and he's not a political activist. He doesn't go out in the streets up. Oh, 
him and David Weiss are the only people making money. You know, the only people with any method of making Nodell any Nodell isn't making any money? Who? Nodell, Bob Nodell? Well, I'd like to have Bob Nodell fade away. So <laughs> I, I, I forgot that. Uh, that yeah, I'd rather not talk about him. Uh, Effie Core finally admitted they're dead after three years of me saying so. Okay. So I'm real happy that we don't have this carrot to follow um, that was never really worth following. And so we still have nothing that's ours, Flat Earthers, you know, and now everyone's running from the word. So yeah, the fact that Austin found something to do, I do give him credit. True. Hold on a second. So Timbo, it's telling me that you need to connect your mic cam before I can add you to the stream. So again, if you're here, um, see if you can connect your mic and camera. And then once he's in, he still needs to check the settings yeah. once he's in at the bottom of the screen here. Um, I, I get what you're saying about the, the people who don't want, uh, who, you know, flat earth, they don't want to be associated with flat earth or, or what have you. Um, but that's a lack of community. We just don't have anything that is flat earth and except fighting with each other or fighting with, with well, people, you know, and you also have folks like Bev who think that, who love to say that, um, that flat earth is a psyop. Um, and, will go out of their way to not say that the earth is flat, which is, I, I, I just recently heard a, a snippet where he was like, have you measured the mm -hmm of the earth when it was clear <laughs> he wanted to say it was flatness, but he couldn't bring himself to say yeah, flatness. He won't. He won't. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it was ridiculous. But now you do yeah. don't want, there's a lot of people that have been around on the globe side that have been around flat earth debate for six years or so um you're dabbling there coming into the next six years um well i've been i've been around i've been on the outskirts like in comment sections and and so forth in since what 2018 um so there is a fascination that flat earthers as they're busy running hi tim as people are busy running from flat earth, the name I'm not going to because people want to talk to flat earthers and they don't care about flat earth and neither do a lot of flat earthers. You know, it's particularly in this case, you see Austin, it's branching out, you know, mm -hmm. so um, auditing, you know, audit everything would be a great idea, but that narrowing it down to NASA might help. Uh, so I, I, Getting anyone to go and do anything is pretty cool to get them to get off their ass, whether they're giving money or showing up to do something. But a show of force is a show of force. I don't know if you know, I wear a lab coat in public yes. and it draw it draws attention. Sure. A lot of people want to tell me I'm a piece of crap for doing that. That how dare I assume that I could do that? Well, we're in a psychological battle. And if it's not a psychological battle, then they're going to say it's a battle of good and evil. But either way, we're in it. We're in a battle up against um, grain. We are going against the grain and we are strange people for doing so. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not a comfortable position. So when people come up and want to say, hey, what are you talking about? It's a huge opportunity for us. You give me a great opportunity to talk about other things. You know, I'm not an expert on these things and I can only speak from, from the heart and from logic. I'm not well, well schooled either, you know? Yeah. And you know, you, and this is kind of where you're talking about, um, you know, moving forward and you're saying that Austin, it's good on Austin for getting this up and, and basically trying to make something that for flat earth uh, so that flat earth can rally. Uh, and you seem to be, you are a true believer. You are really are invested in this cause emotionally. You you are you want this. You you have your reasons for wanting the the greater public to to know what you have to say. Um, but fortunate or not, when I think of Austin, I think of Nathan Thompson. Nathan Thompson was a grifter, like he was. Well, among other things, Nathan Thompson was a grifter, like. His his point or his um, 
his primary motivation was not flat earth. It was Nathan Thompson. who was putting money in his pocket. It didn't matter. And he would do whatever it needed to get done to take money, uh, to put money in his pocket, including stealing from Austin, from my understanding. I don't know too much about that when they, you know, fell apart or what have you. So he was, just using, the, he was just using the income to maintain his lifestyle. And when it came time to working on the vehicles and such, he wasn't that interested in contributing his portions. Yeah. yeah. Again, it was all about Nathan rather than all about the tour. Um, so I mean, Nathan or Austin has put this website together. I would be, uh, I am going to be very interested to know what, what comes of this, where it goes. I mean, you say that this is going to make something for flat earth, but do you know of any others that are basically going to rally behind? Do you know of other people who are planning on donating, rallying behind this, maybe designing some of these courses, anything like that? No, but I think that he's starting with the flat earth audience. I think he can attract another audience this way. So it's really, he's moving away from flat earth in all honesty. And, and at some point, He'd like to use his skills and his knowledge to get into good conversations, possibly like the ones with yourself, you know, where he may, maybe he'll learn something and maybe he'll um, be able to go forward without providing embarrassment as most flat earthers do provide as much embarrassment or more embarrassment than knowledge. Really. You know, we tend to act out a great deal. We're very unusual people going mm -hmm. against the brain. It's, it's, it's an unusual task. It's not, it's not, it's not bright. It's not smart to say, Hey, why don't you go against everything? You know, it's, it's like, well, it's not everything, you know, I'd like yeah. to know it's not everything, but it's a propensity to do so. It's a, mm -hmm. you know, once you start questioning stuff and take that attitude, you can be relentless and, and eventually, um, as you may know, you know, biased and start cherry picking and doing things backwards, researching backwards. Mm -hmm. You know, we thought this and then we looked and we found it. It's like, did you look at everything else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically pulling an art, uh, looking for the quasars that fit his uh, concept and, and, that, and stopping there. If we could figure out how to get into real conversations, uh, I don't know if we'll ever be respected, but throwing our emotions about hasn't been the best plan. No, I, I don't think that's as I've often said, you're never going to insult some uh, insult someone into agreeing with you. Um, so, yeah, I think that if folks want to actually convince, if, if flat earthers really want to convince, I think I might have seen Tim, uh, Tim speak. He's getting closer. Uh, no, I'm, not, I'm just listening. If you can say, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi. Yeah, yeah. No, just listening. G'day, guys. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. Camera. Tim, I, I think I've seen camera, you around, but I don't think I've actually... Yeah. No, nah, my camera's not working, so, yeah. Don't worry. And you never really see my face on, on screen anyway, so that's not a problem for me. <laughs> it's all right. Um, you usually, see, you know, usually see my turtle, turtle avatar floating around. <laughs> well, let, let's give uh, Austin a little credit initially for trying to translate Ken Wheeler, right, wrong, or indifferent, uh, for marching <laughs> about and showing his face. For getting rid of Nathan Thompson, uh, he was in shock the entire rest of the tour, uh, to, to be honest. I tried to get him, you know, to meet up with other flat earthers, and he kind of went out as a lone nut, which is really what I didn't want to see. I wanted to see big groups wherever he was. Mm -hmm. And he did not communicate with people in that respect because he was still really shell-shocked about the Nathan Thompson thing for most of that tour. Uh, do, you, do you think he communicates with people now? Do you think that he collaborates with other flat Earth uh, creators? Assuming there are um, too many of them, you seem to uh, seem to indicate that there really aren't a lot of flat uh, flat Earth creators anymore. But does he collaborate with folks? He's been spending huge amounts of time, twelve hours plus, on Discord on more than one more than one channel, and he convinced me that he's, you know, a real person and all that, you know, yeah. I, I was questioning his motives back then. 
And to be honest, I'm blocked on his channel, on his YouTube channel. So the people that he spends time with um, are against me having a voice in the flat. Yeah, he's, he's, he one, I didn't realize he still had a YouTube channel and he's blocked you? Uh, his moderators have. Okay. So um, same thing with Jaron, same thing with Karen B, same thing with David Weiss, and Bob Nodell has gone out of his way to make sure that I've been removed anywhere that he could. Okay. So I don't have a um, as many friends there as you might think, and I've had to only through Discord interact with um, Witsit enough to know that he's a human being. You know, and that he isn't powering forward blindly. Well, my question then to you is why uh, have you asked what's it to uh, to unblock you or have his moderators unblock you on his uh, on his YouTube channel? <sighs> Something happens when people get busy. OK. Um, when I met him in person the first time, I said, what the fuck? You have me blocked on Facebook. Mm -hmm. He goes, no, I don't. And I go, and then he shows up, shows me on his phone like this. <laughs> Yeah. And I go, but you don't respond to direct messages. He goes, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, okay. And uh, Jaron used to be notorious for not getting back to anyone. That's why you see Jaron spending time with call-in shows now, because there was too many people that couldn't reach him. Okay. Um, when you get busy as a creator of any kind, you don't really have time to mingle if you're sure. trying to edit and do things. And that's what happened to Jaron a long time ago. He spent a lot more time now uh, online. And, of course, if you get hours in online on YouTube, people might send you cash. So it's worth parking it on YouTube every day if you can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, is what, this is what you should plug your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I, I've seen how the game is played. I don't know how I really want, whether or not I really want to do that. Um, I've always said, as I said before, any monies that I get from this endeavor is going are going straight to the uh, the observatory and uh, the outreach with it. Uh, but it, it, you know, you were asking me, I think, you know, how how would I do that? How would I go about it? And if from what I hear, from what the complaint I hear from you is that the flat Earth community is no longer a community. That basically it's fractured. There's nothing to hold on to, and there's nothing to um, really motivate people to get forward it's uh, dead meat it's been dead meat since covid so sure. um but now i mean but what you're describing to me is that you have these creators like jaron and maybe what um what's it or what have you you know they're not getting back to people they're not connecting with people um that seems to be sort of an antithetical to forming a, a movement uh is if you want to form a movement you're going to have to actually have community these folks are going to have to actually uh you know get back to people and to to a get people together a flat earth movement's a waste of time but they don't have a political power the, they're not the type of people that want to be in a group um that's why we need to expand outside and get near let's say people like greenpeace people that care about the earth um you know there are other groups that care about wildlife and the earth yeah. Um, our our goal isn't to become political and a political party. And unfortunately, what's going to make Flat Earth popular is going to be a silly pop star or an athlete. <laughs> so the next thing you know, it's going to be cool to be a Flat Earther. Well, and, then, yeah. and then it's even worse. We got to weed through everyone and find out why they're why they're here. So it's a dead end um, attracting Flat Earthers for the sake of Flat Earth doesn't do much. If it comes out tomorrow, it doesn't change their lives. So their their question is, what difference does it make has some value? Mm -hmm. um, but we live in a world just like that book. Could you hold up that book again with that title? You know, we live in a, a book, uh, uh, a culture of money and war and the bu bureaucracy that makes things happen uh, is somewhat out of our hands. You know, going back to after they parted out the world after World War II. You know, I'm just hoping that that generation's long dead and that there is a new paradigm ahead that has some accountability. And that's 
may be where he's heading with the word audit in terms of accountability. Hey, if they're doing what they say, what can what can we do? Yeah. You know? But at least now we've got sixty or six out either sixty or six thousand people <laughs> willing to take on the next task. You know, it like like SpaceX if they you know if they're kicking the can down the road. So. Um, you say that there are people willing to, to I guess, I, I still, um, I, I, I'm going to have to wait to see on that because, you know, he, he, this is recent. Uh, I think the stuff that he's posted is, you know, from the 13th. So this has been up for maybe a week, maybe two, uh, something like that. So it's, you know, I don't know how much, how much this has gotten around, how many people actually know of this, uh, you know, this time I'm trying to I'm trying to form an intelligent uh, question. Well, how is he taken out of the community anyway? Um, David Weiss, over the past three or four years, has done a good job of trying to do his form of outreach to getting to different audiences, okay. and that's uh, that's vital. But mostly, they just like us because we're uh, laughable. You know, we're a fun show. Yeah, you know, and. I swear we need to take advantage of that. It's all we got is that people want to come and goof goof on us and uh, to find out like you did that I had anything to say about anything else or any knowledge on anything was kind of a surprise and fun. You know, the idea that you could have learned something from us is actually beyond belief. You know, that's beyond belief that we ta taught you something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the astronomy is huge, and there are definitely things that I am not an expert in, or there are definitely uh, events that have happened that I, I don't keep up with. Uh, with So, yeah, getting pointed out that the that there is a distance, there is a distance issue with, uh, with, uh, with Polaris, that was that was fun. Like I, I did not know that, and that's uh, I, I definitely have some papers down to read. Um, but that's so, hard to believe. That's hard to believe. You know, well, you yeah. think you you think your morning gazette might have covered that, <laughs> as opposed to learning it from us. Yeah. So do you think that? Uh, so what do flat earthers want? What is it that? What a, you say that they don't want to become a political organization. Um, what do they want? Do they want anything? Like I don't I th think we can handle management, you know, so that's why I don't think we want to get near. I don't think we can handle the management of other people. Okay. I think we can barely handle ourselves. But accountability, um, you know, to put an end to war wouldn't be as complicated as it sounds. You know, there would just have to be a call for it. Again, Eisenhower, if you get a chance to play his speech, Mm -hmm. absolutely warned us of what he found out in office yeah why he was put in office uh, you know uh, as a front man how little he could do about it and no less than i think 10 months later kennedy appealed to the press to tell the press about it and how little power he had he admitted and mm -hmm. he said that the only through the media can they tell the people can the people um, March, you know, or whatever you uh, can, the people do their job and that, you know, with the press being relatively purchased, mm -hmm. uh, he didn't get any traction and he thought he was president. So he had his brother going after the other powers that be. So he's going after the CIA. His brother's going after the FBI those people are all blackmail artists who have everyone in control, even up to the Hollywood shit you hear about today with the Epstein this and the yeah. the corruption there. It's all a big blackmail game. They get dirt on you and they got you. Mm -hmm. you know? And if you and in real world, if you think you're tough and you go, I don't care what you do to me, they tell you about your kids. They tell you about your parents. Yeah. And you realize, wow, these people mean what they're saying. So you take someone like a Joe Rogan that used to talk about not going to the moon. And one day they approached him. They said, look, you got two ways to go about this. You can have a happy career or we're shutting you down. You know, and he goes, what's it take? He goes, just shut up about the moon. Go on with everything else. And he pretty much did. And that's all it took. And he's, he's happy. They're happy. 
Um, maybe that's maybe that's you know what happened with Alex Jones as well. When we you know we say people get comp you know most of the way there and then compromised. I don't yeah. know, but if you get approached, it's not there's isn't really much you can do. I I, I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna. I don't know about Alex Jones. Alex Jones, that's a whole new topic. Yeah, I don't know about it. But um, with with Rogan, I don't know how much Rogan has been has been pushed back because essentially a lot of people called for Rogan to be canceled after uh, some of his COVID comments, and uh, Spotify said mm, no, um, and because he he has a ten million dollar contract with them, he's the largest podcaster on Spotify, so. I think Joe Rogan has a lot, a lot, a lot of power. But do you think folks like, uh, you know, Geo, uh, folks like what is it, Pierre? What is his name? Saint, Shane Pierre? Yeah, Shane. Uh, Saint uh, Pierre. Shane. You know, do they essentially? What do they want? What do they want from all of this? Do they? You know, uh, yeah, I guess that, that's my point. Is do they want to be? You seem to want to move forward with this to really get a lot of activism, uh, things of that nature. Do they? Can, can I ask a question? Sorry, just trying to pick a spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, I'm a globe, globe side person, um, but um, generally, just so you know where where I stand, <laughs> where I am. Right, well, appreciate um, that. Do you think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, um do you think that there is one flat Earth movement because to me, that seems to be like fifty. Yeah, and, and that's okay, well. That? I mean, um, Dan kind of touched on that, and I'll let uh, what Tim had said. Uh, asked was, is there one flat Earth movement, or is there like fifty of them? Um, and yeah, that's kind of what um, uh, what I see is that it's really a cult of personality. Is that you have you have you know Bev has his acolytes. You've got Oakley. He has his not, acolytes. Not a flat Earth. <laughs> Not a yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and you have and so with with Shane and um, I guess Shane has his his discord server and um, oh by the way just uh, as a side complete just right-handed tangent um, you can't you can't type out COVID or vaccine at the very least if you type COVID or vaccine on his server on Shane's server it immediately gets deleted but, uh, and they say it because they've been shut down twice by a robot. That's there's nobody doing that. That's a robot doing that. Yeah, but, um, yeah. because they, you know, they don't want their their server getting killed. Well, this morning I was so on there, and then someone posted something about Holocaust denial, and I was like, you know what? May not have been COVID that got you killed or got your servers killed. But anyway, um, with with Shane and um, with Geo. You know, yeah, it does seem to be like a cult of personality, and I'm, and again, I'm, I'm expressing my fear that, you know, Wits it may also just be a cult of personality, and they're not really in in this for any, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, mer good goal or altruistic goal. They're just in it to get power for themselves, either through money or through uh, followers or through what have you. Um, I want to imagine us going to England and finding that uh, the pub that you went to last time you were there and the pub that I went to last time of there weren't in the same section of town and they had different football teams, you know, soccer teams. Mm -hmm. So we go to mine and you mention the team and next thing you know, they're looking to kick your ass because you mentioned the opposing team to them. Well, you know, it's neighborly to them. They fight amongst themselves. We know nothing about it. We think, hey, it's all it's all soccer. What's your problem? Would be our first reaction. Okay. How wrong would we be, right? So uh, yeah, because you is... it's football. Because it's, it's called football, and they would have beat you up for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and so well, that too, yeah. Territorial, <laughs> territorially, there's room for a pub in each town anyway. So there's enough people wandering about. Uh, in other words, it's not the, it's not the, the shopkeeper's fault. People are coming around and looking to spend time there. 
and their enthusiasm for what they have is their enthusiasm for what they have. For instance, I don't have an enthusiasm for Austin um, speaking about Christianity and the Bible. And when people <laughs> expressed that to him a week ago, he came back and just did another video about it. He goes, oh, yeah, that to him, he figures, well, I'll just do it anyway. Wow. But he separates it from flat earth mostly. And uh, uh, I, he, I'm almost afraid to know what he has to say about Christianity, uh, to be honest with you. But uh, but kindly, it's a different subject and it gives him somewhere to go to another audience. So think about it that way. If people want to hear him, maybe different people want to hear him for different reasons and doing different things. Um, this is different enough. Anything towards Christianity is different enough. Sitting on Discord for the past year isn't doing him anything financially. And um, he's been preparing things like this. He talks about, you know, what he's doing while he's on Discord. And uh, him and Jaron did put together a conference uh, that wasn't physical. It was virtual. And they're trying to work on the word true earth instead of flat earth. So between uh, yeah, people, people that are interested in not interested in flat earth have somewhere to go. Let's just put it that way. If they're not interested in flat earth, um, I don't blame where, them. Where did I hear that recently? I, I, oh, uh, I was talking I to someone. Like a good plan to me. What was that? Oh, I was just saying to me, it sounds like a, a good plan because a lot of the, what I would call um, more truth seekers aren't, you know, Gleason map type flat earthers. Yeah, um, they're not that they're more <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, you know, I've got problems with Gleason map living in Australia. It doesn't represent my country at all. Um, so there are others there that sort of say, yeah, we get that. And so, but we trying to find our own truth. I can accept that, you know. So to me, to call it, you know, true earth makes more sense than calling it flat earth. <clears throat> so I'm stuck sticking with the flat earth term because people seek me out as a flat earther to talk to me. I fought to be a yeah. flat earther. I can't run from it personally. <laughs> I'd be no, no, stupid. Enough. And also the psychology where people think we're crazy um, is, a, is a psychology. You know, we're, we're out of the box. We're out of the norm. And a lot of people just want to know not what we think, but why we think and how we think. And uh, thinking could be outlawed soon. <laughs> you know, being out of the box may be, de may, may be de deemed unquestionably uh, disorderly. You know, you so think I'm, so? Yeah, think I'm, that, a, I'm afraid okay. that our, our children could easily be incarcerated and medicated for thinking. Yes. Okay. That's a, I, you know, I know that there's, there's a lot of, a lot of issues with cancel culture or what have you at the moment, but I think there's a long way to go before we get to the, you know, Fahrenheit 451 kind of 1984 apocalyptic uh, jailing people for thinking. Like, I don't well, see the connective tissue is I, I guess is what I'm saying. You'd have to look at the uh, negative campaign and censorship against flat earthers and how we're deemed, not by yourself at all, but we're deemed dangerous uh, in society. And it's not for our flat earth beliefs. It's for our willingness to go against the grain. You know, really, it's it, and yeah, we can get conspiratarded and I don't appreciate that. And I don't appreciate the religiotards uh, either. But I will admit the fascinating thing about Flat Earth is many people have gravitated towards it from the Bible. And many people have gravitated to the Bible through Flat Earth. I happen to be a shallow Flat Earther because I have not addressed the Creator. Is that a term? Shallow Flat Earther? I just know that I'm, I'm not, I don't hold strong opinions on how we got here. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, um, so I, I watch, uh, I subscribe to this 
gentleman by the name of Everett Anderson, who basically uh, just mocks um, uh, TikTok videos of flat earthers. Um, I, uh, I probably shouldn't. Uh, I find it funny. For better or for worse, for ugly, I find uh, his videos funny. But they're all almost all TikTok, almost exclusively talk TikTok, and all of the almost all are uh, Christians. At least part of their spiel is they bring in, you know, the Creator, the Bible, what have you. And I've always wondered how big of a intersection there is between Christian fundamentalism and um, and flat Earth. Because when I first got into this, when I first started, you know, like I said, kind of at, in comment sections and the, the people I was following were Oakley, Sleeping Warrior, uh, who else was there uh, back then? D Marble, uh, all these other uh, people. A few of them would bring religion into it, but not a whole lot of them, or at least not that I saw. But now it seems to have flipped the completely around. Like almost everyone that I see on Toon's channel, all of them seem to want to bring in God to explain, you know, if the earth wasn't, that somehow if the earth wasn't flat, God wouldn't exist somehow. So I think um, yeah. it's in terms of us being in a construct where if we're somewhere, uh, who made that? That's, it's, it's that simple. If we, if we're, if this isn't a virtual environment, then there there should be properties that uh, that made it exist. The theory of the Big Bang is a bit wild, um, as as everything coming from nothing and expanding into infinity, which is another wild concept. So nothing and infinity are pretty bold differences and vast and and. Um, we think, I guess, I, I wow, I just got to it. We think that they've diminished man's role of responsibility in his own, in our own development, because it's inconsequential. You're just part of a jil another jillion planets. There's probably people everywhere. You're nothing special. Um, this isn't the center of all things. Okay. If it's proven this is the center of all things then man suddenly becomes more meaningful, you know, and yeah. people want that really bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Oh, God made us in his but, image. But I only find. <laughs> yeah. What do you got? Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. But I only find that I was going to say, I only find the people who say that sort of thing are Christian fundamentalists. <laughs> um, I don't hear any scientists say, no, we're small and insignificant <laughs> in the same context of, Oh, therefore we don't have any responsibility. But the yeah, that's where I find it a bit hard. And I, I have a religious background, so it's not, not a case of me being an atheist and saying, Oh, this is one side. I actually <laughs> I'm actually not an atheist. And um <clears throat> but I do find that the only people who seem to push this idea that oh all the scientists are trying to make this seem small and secure is is religious people, not <laughs> the scientists themselves. <laughs> yeah, I um I can almost and so. Big, um, hmm? And tell us the the biggest obstruction. Go on, go on, go on. Oh, I was going to say, and I'm, I don't have my memory for quotes is really bad, but you know, I've listened to uh, folks like Neil deGrasse Tyson. I've listened to folks like uh, what was it Hutchinson? Um, who was the other? Who was the other? Uh, Hawkins. Uh, Dawkins. The biologist, yeah, the well, environmental yeah, biologist, Dawkins. 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 Yeah. You know, and he's a funda he's a he's a fundamental scientist. <laughs> yes, he's an uh, as I refer to him, he, they, all three of them are anti theists. They're they're not atheists. They're anti theists. Um, yes. uh, they they, t they basically they do not believe in God, and they don't think you should believe in God either. Um, yeah. And so with those voices, I think the, the Christian fundamentalists or the, the folks on the flat earth who seem to have this opinion of, oh, we're insignificant is because they're getting it from them. And I have to say, I can buy that. I, mean, I don't have a, a quote of, say, Dawkins saying that people are insignificant because, you know, we're just stuff or dust floating through space. But that is the impression he tends to give people. He's a, at least he's given it to me. I, I can see where they get it from. 
Hmm. I can see where they get it from. If you take it, to me, I took most of those comments are more about trying to illustrate how big the universe is, not trying to hmm. say how small we are in it. But I can understand how you could then transfer that into they're saying we're um, small than insignificant. But, uh, yeah. But it's, I, personally, I don't think that's what they're saying. But yes, they are anti theists. Um, and personally, yeah, my I, opinion is that you can, you can believe in God and you can believe in pretty much any science that you want, as long as it, uh, you, you need to make that judgment call yourself. It's not, a, not something a scientist can tell you, oh, you're ridiculous for believing in God. That's, that's, you know, that's your call, you, not theirs. <laughs> yeah. You will find me avoiding the word believe, though. Because believe is faith based, and I don't find it to be scientific at all. Yeah, that's why I don't mix my my faith with my religion or with my science. Right? Um, one yeah. really, I try very hard for one not to inform on the other. Um, so, uh, so therefore, I don't believe in the flat Earth. I just think that I've measured large flat areas um, in a, in a world that's messed up and and yeah. with a lot of a lot of deceit and a lot of behind the scenes operation that's um elusive at best to, and not productive but that's that's based on your observation as opposed to someone who's coming from a bible side trying to argue that you know because the bible says there are four corners of the earth so therefore the earth is a square you know which i have heard <laughs> Plus, I'm an American, so all we know is being American. You know, we're not. We don't. Yeah, have a big, we don't have a big world view to begin with. It's really hard because I can hear how you know. I, I can see in the time, like I'm over, well over fifty, right? So I can see in the time that I've been around, where where America was from our point of view, from outside of America, say forty years ago, and where America is now. I can understand why there's a lot of confusion in America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try to I try to keep my Americanness, you know, contained. <laughs> May I suggest and, and it's, it's hard because right. there's fifty states and it's different everywhere, but yeah. Go yeah. On. <laughs> <laughs> but America is a lacking of culture, and one of the biggest cultural things we have is this thing with guns. And, and money, you know, capitalism. So we are a, a, a culture of money and war. And I've yeah. found that in general, Globers, as we call them, Glober culture is what you're born into. So if I was born somewhere else, I would naturally adapt that culture. So flat earthers found themselves in, in, a, cult, in a globe culture. Um, it's not easy to, you know, to be a minority. Well, it's funny. It's funny you should say that because, again, when I came into this, almost all of the, uh, all of the, sort of flat earthers that I encountered were British, um, and so it was only until later that I started seeing more and more American uh, flat earthers coming to and uh, coming into the mix. Uh, but you know, I agree that. We and I certainly agree that uh, we in the United States have a culture of guns, of uh, guns, violence, and neo-Calvinism in terms of work ethic and and capitalism and things of that nature. I will re I will rebel against the idea that Americans have no culture. That that I think is I think that's easily seen that the people in the southern states have their own set of culture and values. People in the Midwest have their own sort of values people in the north northwest have even different values so i think culture is there it's just not as uh, i think you're talking about regional traditions and not yeah, not much culture really i think the most thing that you and i share culturally would be tv commercials aren't you glad you use dial you know <laughs> we remember uh that's a lot of what we share in other words a movies sports a lot of yeah. a lot of superficial shit is what you and i would share you know because it was pitched to us as being good stuff have you ever um we all grew up with disney you know as americans i don't know if you remember watching it on sunday night with your family oh yeah 
and Wild World of Animals, you know, it was mm -hmm. a big, big we, moment. We, we did that tier too, so yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, Disney on Sunday was the norm. Going Part of, that was the last time Americans, you know, the last time families were together. Um, just like, I, I just, it just, it strikes me as, uh, it, I actually kind of feel weird when I hear that um, something that I think of as essentially quintessential American was, is experienced by um, people outside of America, because I'm like, and, and are we imperialists? Like, you were, you were uh, for a little while. But so it's, so it's, like, it's like I just kind of feel guilty that we were we're everywhere. I, I don't know. Um, but so something like Disney that was delivered to us as being pure family um, bonding, even in hindsight, the guy must have hated his mother because there's no strong female roles in Disney, and yeah. that's amazing. To think that that could be a serious subliminal message is that they're they're less than substantial in our lives, and at some point the yeah. women's movement came about in this in the country in the sixties here, and then before you knew it, women weren't in the home anymore. There was no matriarch, and uh, therefore they didn't know to use vinegar to clean anymore. Now they're going to get a specific product. It used to be what vinegar, bleach, baking soda. There was like four products in the house to clean everything. And now you got 35 different things you buy because nobody remembers, you know, uh, we send our kids to, to uh, preschool and our parents to an old person's home and we've cut off the generational learning. Um, even the I think tradition. that's got more to do with capitalism. Honestly. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's, I would go with that you, myself. It's, it's, if you, if you have the option, um, if you have the opportunity to, you know, if you're a company and you're like, all right, I sell vinegar. Um, okay, that's great. But what if I could sell three types of vinegar that are really not all that different from one another, but I can convince people that they that you need this particular vinegar to clean your table, this particular vinegar to clean your windows, and this particular vinegar to clean your, uh, your granite top, uh, stove tops. And those are the only uh, vinegars that are going to work. Then... I think the company is going to go with the 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 range that's going to get them more money. Uh, trying to convince money, people, yeah. yeah, trying to convince people that they have that they're they need to buy products they don't actually need. Uh, and it stems back to something you said before about money. I think that's been the main driver for the last forty years, and I think that's where a lot of this has changed. Is about a company is a nameless beast. And it's about the money, not about its social contract. So, yeah. yeah. I'd love to change the word uh, profit to prosperity. You know, I, I think the goal should be prosperity and not profit. And, yeah. Uh, well, oh, in that yeah. sense, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it, that would be nice, but then you would have to, I think, uh, radically change human nature uh, for, that to, <laughs> for that to take hold in any really meaningful way. There, that answers your question. Then, what what would flat earthers want to radically change human human nature? Thank you. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you got to the answer. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Fair enough. But uh, you know, but unfortunately, I can't. Like, I keep going back to it. Is, is the cult of personality is that, and that's the 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 nature that you're going to have to change is that there is a lot. And I'm not saying that Flat Earth is the monopoly on this, that there is not a cult of personality on the, the globe side or what have you. Um, but I do, I definitely see it in, on the Flat Earth is that it's, uh, to me, it strikes me as these folks are out there and it's not about the topic anymore. It's about listen to me because I'm cool. Listen to me because I'm so much smarter than everybody else. Uh, and you need to give me money because I am so much smarter than everybody else, and I can, I can make your arguments for you. I guess um, uh, he's the only one doing that. He's the only one with enough depth to actually say stuff like that or ask for money. You know, the average flat earther is driven um, by their emotions more and um, their desire to reach towards the world. Okay. You know, and you'll find that 
the vast majority are very unselfish. Very oh, flat earthers. Very unselfish. Very, very, very. Okay. No, maybe an argument. You know, they want to win an argument. That's different. <laughs> but they're not asking for something of anyone else. Uh, I find them to be very giving of themselves. And uh, I've, I'm pretty sure that's almost all the way across the board. I did forget Nathan Thompson and Nathan Oakley as being people that had made money. Other than that, it's Jaron and Weiss, David Weiss. Uh, so there's maybe six people in the world generating money uh, of, of enough to live off of. You know, that's not a lot. Mm. Not a lot of people grift, grifting their way through this. Not really. Okay. Uh, look, the, that's just been really good. I've got to head off. Unfortunately, it's getting dark, and I've got a few things to do before it uh, night falls. So, oh, um, it's been really good. Um, enjoyed it a lot. I'll catch. Hope yeah. I might catch Appreciate you coming time. on. Yeah. Thanks for joining. Yeah. There you go. Hey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I sent uh, Gio a direct, a direct message just in case he's interested in coming around. He has a tough time moderating. Um, these Discord servers are interesting as they end up taking on the personality of the host. Um, how you guys do? Uh, how you guys have Dmock anywhere near you all is fucking amazing to me. The man is uh, how should I put this? Toxic. Can um, I tell you? Can I tell you a secret? Sure. Prior to Discord, I spent time with him for a couple of years. Really? In a drunken crowd, in a pub, in a pub crowd. So that he, I can buy. <laughs> he's fucking hysterical. But that I can he, buy too. But when he moved to Discord, they didn't know him, and he changed his persona to someone that had something to say instead of just having fun. And he got traction there. And okay. he's easy to fight with, and people were looking to fight. And that's become the democ that you know. All right. Okay. Because, yeah, I, I, you know, you tell me that he likes to hang out, uh, and likes to hang out in pubs and he's fun at pubs. I can buy that because I've known people like that. It was just I, a drinking environment where in the yeah. Poncho Pete days, it was uh, a drinking environment and it wasn't, um, scientific it was for fun it was all for fun he'd sure. get off work late around midnight his time maybe one and he'd pop on and he'd be winding down and he'd goof on on everything you know mm -hmm. he just does it with a different style now he has acquired some language um that surprises <laughs> me that he might know something but normally he has a a, a real weird knack of word salading and finding the subject again somehow Okay. Um, and it's funny to hear him make a point because he didn't, he started just goofing on words. Um, that style has changed when he came. He never went back when he came to uh, Discord. He never went back to his, uh, his old personality at all. And his personality was uh, purely jovial and having a good time. Um, yeah, good time. That, that, that ain't the DMOC I know. Or no. Like seen he's uh yeah he's pretty pretty, pretty fucking toxic um it the only things you have to say are insults and that's it that's he doesn't really add anything to a conversation so no but he got sought out by a couple of people maybe you know um the brits you know you talked about the brits and mm -hmm. sometimes i just think it's not part of our deal and we should leave them alone and other times i'm interested in the global economy and the global input yeah. but the Brits think different than we do, and uh, they like a style of argument more than discussion. It's like, okay. are you are you using words? It's like, <laughs> yes. And it's like, oh, well, <laughs> a nice Bevan pro person. Like, you got you might speak in a sentence if you would. And it's like, well, I'm sorry, I would have if you hadn't interrupted me. Oh, I interrupted you, did I? You know, and it's this semantic sort of challenging every inch of your wording. And the subject doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Then yeah. you'll find something else fantastic. If it's your show and you got eight people on panel and you get one person of opposition, well, you just push them about from person to person to person. Uh, it shocked me to do that, you know, to see it inverted on the other side. And there's a lot of inversion. You know, there's we honestly, if I say you and I on opposing sides, 
will see things from the opposite position. Hmm. It's very, you know, very, what is that, subjective? Is that what they call that? Um, I mean, I can, I can empathize, empathize with your point of, point of view. I mean, I can, I can at least have enough respect to see where you're coming from. Um, I mean, I can't stand that you accept the, the clickbait media and that, you know, for, for space, but you think it's normal. It's a huge difference between us. Yeah. And I wouldn't say that I accept it so much. Um, you know, obviously I don't think they're deliberately lying to us. My problem with, with the clickbaity crap is that they don't get the science right or they uh, they're trying to sensationalize something that really isn't all that sensational. My biggest problem, like my um, kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? It's sort of in a trivial way. You know, there was a whole lot of hay being made of the great green comet. And I'm like, really, I've looked at it. Uh, and it's not that impressive. Most comets that are that come close to the Earth really aren't that great to look at. So I don't know why it was getting so much hype, but it certainly drove a lot of people to our observatory. So I can't complain, really. Um, and the fact that it was green, assuming you had a very good camera to see it, um, was kind of was kind of cool. Um, but, Why was it so brief? Why was it only uh, so briefly around? Oh no, it's still around. It's still around till uh, February. But it's a, it's a, it is a long period comet, which is a really bad term. But uh, it's in a very eccentric orbit, and so what that means is that its orbit. So if you have the sun here, it swings by the sun fairly close, and then goes way out, and then comes back in. And what that means is that it spends a whole lot of its time, because what Kepler tells us is that an object that's way far away from the sun is going to travel far more slowly than when it's close to the sun. So it literally is zipping by the, the sun, and then the rest of its 56,000-year period, it's mostly going to be out in the tail ends of space, of the solar system. So... It seems like every time something comes near Earth, they go, we didn't know it was coming. That, that's sort of disappointing. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a very, that's actually a concern that uh, I don't know if, if uh, folks are not, um, if, if NASA is not making that more of a concern to prevent panic, but, um, you know, one of the things that NASA is trying to do is if you look up uh, PANSTARS, PANSTARS is a satellite or is a telescope system in uh, Mauna Kea whose sole job is to look for near-Earth asteroids, asteroids that are very close to us that could potentially slam into us and kill everybody on the planet. The problem is near-Earth asteroids as a, uh, as a group tend to be very dark and very small, so they make them very, very hard to find. So when you hear a, like, oh, we didn't see this comet coming or we didn't see this asteroid before, it's because they're very, very difficult to find. And there's not a lot of uh, current resources being uh, thrown at trying to find them. So, so that's uh, interesting uh, when they talk about an object coming between us and the moon. It seems pretty damn close. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and it is, and it is. Uh, do, do you think we're under um, any potential threat from the sky in our, in let's say, our lifetime, yours and my lifetime? It, that's it's hard to say at this point. You're talking about statistics, um, and so, like for instance, um, you know, as I like to joke around with people. You know, the star Betelgeuse and Orion can supernova any time between now and 100,000 years from now. Um, what I can tell you is that from a statistical analysis, um, a world-ending extinction-level event uh, collision happens every 6,500 million years, depending on who you talk to. So by that, we're due. By that, we are kind of due for something to come by and, and smack into us and basically annihilate most all life on the on planet. 
then if you then it actually kind of gets worse because as you look at asteroids or impactors that could really you know mess up a continent then yeah we are in fact due for one of those um so yeah uh, i don't know i don't know really is it something we should be worried about absolutely um but on the other hand, there's really not much we can do about it. So I don't know what to. Sometimes I think that the people in charge know that there's no future. That's why they don't care for the earth. Uh, let's just say GE, for instance, you know, their nuclear practices, you know, large oh. companies like that. So I, I think it's far simpler than that. I think it's, it's not that they I don't think they care about the future. That's not part of their bottom line. The bottom line is, is instant gratification is how much money can I get now? Um, uh, you know, screw the screw the future. Let's, I don't want to have any kind of far-sighted plan as to the ramifications of what I'm doing now, so long as now gives me money. Well, I was trying to think why, you know, why they wouldn't care. And uh, I thought, well, what if they know we get wiped out? And I started to think about pole shifts and the Zodiac cycle. Mm -hmm. being a 26,000 year cycle. And I go, wow, halfway through that would be 13,000 years. So I type in the words 13,000 years ago, boom, younger Dryas event, giant flood, just like the Bible says. And I went, whoa, you know, how insightful am I? You know, could there just be a simple flip-flop magnetically halfway through the cycle? The answer is sure. Well, I mean, if the, the 26,000 year period that you're talking about is the precession of the earth. Uh, so that's basically the, the motion of the, so right now the Polaris is essentially the North star, uh, in a few hundred years, we will definitively notice that it's not anymore in 26,000 years later, it will, you know, process around the sky until finally Polaris becomes the North star again. So it's just a little wobble. Like they say, it's not a big flip. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, I don't know about calling it a little wobble, but it is a wobble. It's a very slow, slow wobble, and it doesn't have anything to do with the magnetic field of the Earth. Why, why did they try and add uh, Opificus back? or the Ophiuchus. Third? Oh, yes, Ophiuchus. Why, uh, where, where did that come from? Right, so, talking about something out of nowhere. So um, that becomes, uh, all right, so. I don't want to get into astrology. I agree. You know, I, I don't mean that. No, no. It's it, it, you can. I can see how someone could be conspiratorially minded. Basically, I'm having an internal argument between me and an astrologer. Is that uh, technically speaking, a zodiacal sign is a sign through which the sun passes through. So, if the sun passes through Cancer, Cancer is a zodiacal sign. Now, the the iffy part of it is. What do you define as the boundaries of a constellation? So apparently the early astrologers uh, thought that the boundaries only encompassed uh, those 12. But astronomers came later and actually codified it, uh, codified it because we want to essentially use constellations as states uh, or provinces. We want to be able to say it's in this, when we say that something is in the constellation of Orion, we know a specifically mapped out section of space that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when whoever did that, did that, they mapped out Ophiuchus such that it dips into the path of the, of the sun. So depending on how you define it, then the sun actually passes through the constellation of Ophiuchus. Um, and so there are actually 13 zodiacal signs to astronomers whereas there are only 12 to astrologers. And then the procession causes things to get even more wonky. Uh, in reality, the sun was in the constellation of Pisces when I was born, not the constellation of Aries when I was born. So, really? Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. See, Your I'm astrological kidding. sign, as it's stated in the paper, is probably wrong. Probably affecting tattoo artists more than anything else. <laughs> Well, no, actually, it's funny you should say that because I actually have a right, very <laughs> tattooed on my arm. So, uh, and I and I had a tattooed after I knew about the fact that I was actually a person. I just think Aries are cooler. So, you know. That's funny. Um, but, um, but, yeah. I don't know where that came from. But, um, 
Well, we should go before we drag it on, you know, yes. unless you have something else you want to talk about. We, I, I like it when you and I are fresh. Otherwise, you know, we get too personal. No, no, no. I, I, I get it. I get it. Um, and, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I probably should go get something to eat, maybe. Um, for some reason, I'm now on a nocturnal schedule. Um, I will just put this back up for those of you who uh, I think, Cygnus, you're the only one actually watching anymore. Um or at least you're the only one commenting. So, yes, to end this stream, uh, I'm talking here with uh, Dan the Waterman. We were discussing uh, this new endeavor by Austin Witsit, uh, NASA Audits, uh, which apparently is advocating holding NASA accountable. Oh, I know you're watching. I, I know you're watching, guys. Uh, holding NASA accountable. Um, it, it has a blog for um, people. You can contact them. Uh, it says that eventually it's going to, you can purchase classes that allow you to, or purchase classes to figure out how to audit NASA. And by audit, I mean, contact them, interview them, so forth and so on. So you can buy classes to learn how to do that. In six days, you can buy merch. Uh, I'm glad that there's a countdown because I don't know how I would live my life without knowing exactly <laughs> to the second when I could buy NASA audits merch. <laughs> um, you can join the mailing list and something that I might just do for the, just for the fun, uh, for shits and giggles. I may actually apply to become a part of the NASA audits team. Although I will redact, uh, my personal information in my CV. Mm -hmm. So, um, I will only provide what I've already provided out there, which is my name and my email address. So, uh, I, and, and we will see what we see on that. So that's what uh, um, we're, uh, what we were talking about. Dan, uh, last things you want to say? Yeah, I hope for transparency on this and any ventures that people get into. Uh, thank goodness we got rid of FE Core, who had an incredibly deep transparency problem from the from day one. And it, it caused a lot of dissension amongst us that could have been cleared up if we known it was over with. Um, they're the only ones that put together a 501c3. And... Um, with access to monies caused all the issues that you might expect um, from there as to who gets to uh, allot it in what position. And they started to look to get reimbursed for time uh, spent on projects and putting price tags on objects that were time-based and not uh, material-based. Mm -hmm. So if I tinkered with stuff and asked to get paid for it, that's probably not cool. Um, so, I'm going to uh, thumbs up to Austin right now as an activist. Um, the other thing that I would be interested in is something I, I really am doing with you is speaking to more people who teach okay. and find, you know, and that, I think that's super valuable. Um, you know, um, that is super valuable for both. Look, it's working both ways for you and I. So of course it's valuable. Talking to ourselves isn't very valuable. We were so excited to meet each other and hug each other till we found out, sort of like the religious people, there isn't one type of Christian mm -hmm. and there isn't one type of flat earther. Yeah. Oh, and unfortunately, when you get me, you're not getting, you know, you're only getting a small slice. And same thing with the Brits, you know, you yeah. only got a small slice. And uh, good job for you for uh, still being interested and still finding a way to apply it to your, to your job and your life. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely is, uh, is giving me sort of uh fuel. I, I'm trying to take the things that I encounter on uh, in my conversations with flat earth and turn them into essentially teaching moments. Like uh, it, it has most recent encounters have really, motivated me to do a series on the cosmic distance ladder. How do astronomers actually determine the distances to celestial objects and why you should trust us? Um, that they were, so I think it's going to be different talking to Austin Witsit than it will be talking to Geo. I think you'll appreciate Geo more and get more, oh, yeah. life, more life out of that, where Austin's going to look to set you straight and, and you're looking to set him straight. Uh, you and Geo won't go through that. 
No, no. I mean, like I said, I've, I, well, you know that I've had a conversation, a fairly lengthy conversation with Gio. Um, and I have had a, a small conversation with Witsit um, where, yeah, he, he frequently tried to tell me things about astronomy that were wrong. Uh, basically, he was trying to mansplain astronomy to me, and um, I had to correct him on that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, but I hear what you're saying. With Austin, it's going to be a little bit more, hopefully not con contentious, but it is definitely going to be oh, a good word. conversation, assuming I even have a conversation with the man. Uh, I hope you have more than one. I really yeah. do. And, and I hope that you stick around um, through our emotion, emotional side, which is never very pretty. Mm. You don't know my reputation at all. I'm no a reputation? I, yeah, I'm a yeller and a screamer. I just don't do it with you. <laughs> well, I, I saw right before I got into that uh, conversation with Gio, you were really riled up about uh, with Bob, Bob, Bob the Lion guy, uh, Bob the Bob, Science guy. No, it wasn't Bob. It was Zanuck. Uh, yeah, he's a time waster. Yeah. What is it, Zanuck? Okay, yeah. Um, but it was Bob that got me wound up. Bob oh, would accept. He wouldn't accept any of my heights, any of my distances. And it was the Salton Sea. Everyone's worked at the Salton Sea. Okay. You know, and he was pounding me for elevations. And uh, it was just, he was nitpicking me to death because uh, he was using style against me, you know? Yeah. So. Well, um, I, I, I have interacted with Bob a little bit and. Um, uh, he has, he branched out or he reached out to see if uh, he wanted to do a collab with me, which I would very much like to do. So hopefully I, don't, I'll I, don't, I don't, I don't trust him or like him, um, but he's going to, he wants, he wants to be in your bracket. So well, you know, he's, he's got a real nice personal telescope setup. His observatory is pretty fun. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I do have to say that. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're both there, though, because you're both actually accessible, and uh, we don't have that uh, option very much. We're not really welcome to stroll in to labs, you know, of any yeah. kind. Well, you know, I I can try to put people in contact with others. I cannot. Uh, I cannot. Um, what's the word? Guarantee keep your, keep your ears open. I'm just saying. Keep yeah. your, if anyone yeah. wants to talk to us, particularly in fields of optics or you know, a different fields. Even if they want to pick on us, um, we get value out of it. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I find that when academia speaks, they show their limitations because they're usually quite narrow in what they know because they teach what they teach. Yeah. Um, you're you're very unusual in your quickness to admit no. what you don't know. Oh, that yes. Most people do not do that, Rob. Most people don't do that. Thank you for being a human being because <laughs> not you. everyone's got time to time for that to be yeah. a human being. Yeah. It's very, very nice of you to do that. Appreciate that. Thanks for inviting me on. Hey, no problem. Thanks for coming on. Uh, and so uh, I'll see you later and I'm just going to close up this, uh, this shot. All right, folks. Um, thank you all for, for being here tonight. I really appreciate uh, you spending your Friday evenings with me, Friday mornings or whatever time it may be to paraphrase a certain gentleman from Westchester County. Um, so yeah, tomorrow at some point I will be giving yet another live lecture. I don't know when, but I will be giving yet another love live lecture on the moon. Specifically, I will be talking about uh, how the gravitational attraction between the earth and the moon uh, causes things like tides, uh, causes uh, the moon to become synchronous, synchronously locked, and how that is ultimately going to affect um, uh, the Earth and what the Earth-Moon system is ultimately going to look like, assuming it doesn't get fried by the sun. Uh, and I might, if I have time, put eclipses in there. If I don't have time, then I'll make a th third one. Of eclipses. Um, and uh, my normal spiel, uh, if you like this sort of content, if you like the conversations that I have, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, my, my content is either astronomy education or conversations like I had with Dan talking about uh, flat, earth, uh, flat Earth beliefs or uh, Flat Earth beliefs, the Flat Earth community, that sort of thing. Or I guess now the, the True Earth community is it's 
may be coming uh, to be known. So if you like that sort of thing, like, share, and subscribe. Uh, if you'd like to help me in my uh, outreach, one of my career goals is to uh, truly open up the, the public outreach here at, uh, here at George Mason, uh, particularly to go out and provide astronomy resources to, to those communities that, for whatever reason, cannot provide those resources for themselves. So if you want to uh, support me, please, at this point, uh, be, consider becoming one of my patrons. Uh, one of the benefits is I uh, you get to name my firstborn child, assuming that my partner at the time uh, agrees. Um, but also there are real, uh, really useful ones, like uh, depending on the level, I would be more than happy to get into uh, get in get in get with you to talk about a research program, how you would actually do observations to uh, show some kind of astrophysical uh, concept. So yeah, um, so yeah, end of pitch. All right, guys, peace out, clear skies, and I'll see you on the next one.